Please enter your PIN and then press pound. After the tone, please record your name and then press pound. Melissa. Uh, and we will be starting very shortly once we kind of get everybody to move around a little bit. Um, so I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much.
Okay, um, I know we don't have Trustee Sipkar back in the room yet, but uh, we're going to get started um, on the agenda and she will join us very shortly. She is in attendance. Um, and so um, I'm going to read the, the land acknowledgement here. Okay. So we acknowledge that we are on land and surrounded by water originally inhabited by indigenous peoples who have traveled this area since time immemorial. This territory is within the lands honored by the wampum treaties, agreements between the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenni Lenape, and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Specifically, we would like to acknowledge the presence of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, and Huron-Wendat peoples. We are dedicated to honoring Indigenous history and culture, while remaining committed to moving forward respectfully with all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Uh, quickly, before we get to the special orders of the day, um, I wanted to uh, let everyone watching know, and anyone who's just uh, popped in, that we have a... Um, We've amended our agenda, so our board must open each meeting in public session before we can convene into private session, and we do this at 6 p.m. So at that point, we call the meeting to order, take attendance, and also approve the agenda with any amendments motioned, seconded, and voted on by all trustees. In this case, L11 was struck from the agenda as it was not in order. This was a decision endorsed by majority vote of trustees, and as such, it will not be debated or delegated on this evening. And so we are moving now to special orders of the day. I ask you if you could please stand. It is with heavy hearts that we pay tribute to Cousy James. It was a privilege to have Cuzzy the last three years at Forest Glade Public School in the Gaines program. Cuzzy was a sweet and loving boy who brought strong relationships with those around him. He was admired by his peers who have been missing his presence deeply. Cuzzy impacted the lives of everyone he met. He was an incredible force, full of love, energy, and compassion. His enthusiasm for life was contagious. His beautiful megawatt smile would light up every room he entered, and he had a sparkle in his eye that he was, was both rare and beautiful. Cuzzy's creativity and artistic talents were gifted to us every day through his love of drawing and painting. He loved bubble guppies and baking. His signature head tilt and giggle were always his way of showing pride in his work, forever leaving footprints on our hearts. His energy was infectious. He found great happiness when everyone around him was having fun alongside of him, dancing and singing to his favorite silly songs like Tutti Ta, Daddy Finger, and Freeze Dance. We truly believe because he taught us all more but he could have, than we could have ever taught him. He taught us how to communicate with no words, always dance like no one is watching, and start every meal with dessert first. Because his life and legacy will continue to live on, on with all who knew him. Please join me in a moment of silence for Cuzzy. And now a tribute to Jace Ovey. Gosfield North staff and students fondly remember Jace. We have great memories of a little boy who captured our hearts from the moment he arrived. His inner strength and resilience was amazing to watch as he came in as the new kid and just wanted to be like every child in the classroom. What is most memorable about Jace is how we instantly made friends with the other students in our classroom. He loved to share, especially his idea ideas during class discussion and partner work. He was quick, quick to lend out a marker or a pencil to someone who needed it. He loved to be able to help others. He always had a smile on his face and an eagerness to share his stories and knowledge, especially in science class. 
He was a kind soul. He really enjoyed chatting with his peers during class activities. He liked to tell jokes to his classmates, and he made everyone laugh. We looked forward to seeing his wonderful big and bright smile and beautiful eyes every day. We loved his positivity and his vibrant spirit. Jace definitely lived, left an imprint on our hearts and everyone at Gosfield North. Our hearts go out to Chris, Kelly, Tommy, and Evan. Your superhero will always be remembered. You may be seated. Thank you, Director Kelly. Do we have any declarations of conflict of interest for in here, trustees? Madam Chair, this is Trustee Olmstead. Go ahead, Trustee Olmstead. Um, I will. First, just before this, I, um, as an individual who knew Jace, um, I just wanted to echo the director's sentiment. He was a true superhero. Um, as for my declaration of conflict of interest, I will be declaring for agenda item F, which is action of the board meeting and private session, as my, hu my husband is a member of Lois STS and an employee of the board. And the action or the interest is pecuniary in nature. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Olmstead. We are now at F, actions of the board meeting private session, uh, chair of, of that. Thank you. So we're gonna do uh, F1 and F2, and we're gonna do it together if everybody's okay with that. Trustee Hatfield and Trustee Satori. Um, all in favor? All opposed? Passed. Thank you very much, Trustee Cook. We are now at approval of the minutes. We have, uh, and we can move these together as well, if everyone's okay with that. Uh, Trustee Hatfield and Trustee LeClaire, thank you so much. Madam Chair. Indeed. Burgess. Go ahead. Um, for the last 10 seconds, prior to actions of the committee, the whole, just right then, I was trying to unmute. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> when people call a vote, I wonder if you could give us a second to unmute. Um, I wanted to know under what, uh, under the Education Act, under what thing we were just discussing something in private. So uh, the actions of the committee whole, as I know, are uh, under negotiations. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Do we have any discussion on approval of the minutes? All in favor of approval of the minutes? G1 and G2, thank you very much, trustees. Any business arising from the minutes? Trustee LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in reference to the uh, meeting on the 17th of November, 2020, um, item L3, which was in relation to um, us asking for consideration or have the Transportation Consortium consider uh, masking of all students. Um, I'm wondering if we can't, can address the the gap that's uh, come to my attention, and I shared this, the experience with the other trustees this this week regarding a student and the fact that there has to be some exemptions to mandatory masking of children on school buses, uh, particularly medical medical exemptions. Um, the student was denied uh, the opportunity to ride the bus despite the fact that they uh, had medical a medical reason not to be wearing a mask and the consortium uh, was less than um, cooperative when the mother called. And so there is a resolution to uh, how to do that, and that is make sure that the principal um, is aware and uh, makes arrangements, but that wasn't communicated uh, effectively either on our website or um, to the principals themselves. Um, so I'm just wondering if we can do something to address that. That's it. Was that a question to administration? Yep. Trust, or Superintendent Armstrong? Um, thank you for that. I'm aware of the uh, issue that Trustee LeClaire had raised, and I did clarify with him that if there is a reason why a child is unable to wear a mask, if they're from um, on the bus, that uh, the parent does need to contact the school principal, and that a tag is provided 
um, by the school for the child to put on their backpack, which readily identifies that they no longer they're not required to wear a mask. Um, our principals, I thought, were aware of it, so um, I'm surprised by that, but I'm certainly happy to communicate that just to make sure that that is clear to everyone. And just just second to that, it, the the transportation should have known that as well, right? They should not have said to her that riding a bus is a privilege. Um, transportation was the one that established the process with the tags, so I'm, like I said, I'm a little bit surprised, but I'll certainly address it. Thank you very much. Any other business like arising it? from the minutes? I'll give those on the phone a minute. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience uh, on that. So moving forward to presentations, we have our student trustee presentation and I see uh, student trustee Unger is gonna start tonight. Thank you. A huge accomplishment for the month of November was the success of the board's first ever virtual student leadership conference. The conference was held on the afternoon of Friday, November 27th, and we were honored to have Mr. Jagmeet Singh, leader of the New Democratic Party, as our keynote speaker. Mr. Singh shared his experiences growing up as a person of color and working in Canadian politics. There was an opportunity for Mr. Singh to answer questions from students on a variety of important topics. We had an incredible turnout of more than 300 participants for the live event, which was open to students in grades 7 to 12. The conference also featured breakout rooms on the topics of environmental sustainability and mental health and wellness, which were facilitated by members of Student Senate. To conclude the conference, we kept up the tradition of a showcase of school cheers virtual style which forced schools to get creative. The conference also allowed us the opportunity to promote coffee chats, our networking opportunity to, for students to pair up with a student from another school to discuss student engagement and share ideas. Overall, the virtual conference was an incredibly successful event and a rewarding payoff after weeks of planning and practice. It was a great learning experience and we received abundant positive feedback. We're hopeful to carry on our new skills for future virtual conferences. Arabella and I are, are appreciative of our subcommittee comprised of student senate members who were instrumental in planning and executing the event. We'd also like to thank Director Kelly for her support of this virtual endeavor and for bringing greetings to the students. Student Senate is preparing for our holiday activity of writing letters to senior residents in long-term care homes. We'll be writing to residences in the city and in the county, and we're looking forward to this opportunity to spread holiday greetings and positivity to our communities. Student Senate is also moving forward with our top three initiatives, and we've created subcommittees on the topics of anti-racism, mental health and wellness, and environmental sustainability. Student Senate members have joined these subcommittees according to their interests, and we're really looking forward to taking action on these priorities. Arabella and I are extremely hopeful about what the new year will hold, and we are grateful for that support we have received as we work through these unprecedented, unprecedented and challenging times. Thank you. Oh, oh, go ahead. So now I'm just gonna present our student of the month for December uh, with the theme of collaboration. So the student of the month for December is Tamjeed Nawaz, a grade 12 student at Vincent Massey Secondary School. Tamjeed truly exemplifies this month's theme of collaboration. Since his first year at Massey, Tamjeet has participated in a number of school clubs, including Science Olympiad, Literature Club, Model UN, and The Sting, Massey's school newspaper. This year, Tamjeet has taken on leadership roles in many of these, working collaboratively with the executives and members to ensure they run smoothly and successfully during this challenging time. Tamjeet's most prominent undertaking this year is running a can drive as a part of Massey's Believe Leadership Initiative. Tamjeet is collaborating with a team of students to make this event successful while following all public health protocols. Prior to the pandemic, Tamjeet volunteered at his local mosque and he continues to donate his time to the Al Marib Institute, a global education program for Islamic studies. An exemplary student and role model, Tam Tamjeet applies his collaborative skills to everything he does. Congratulations, Tamjeed, for being selected by Student to Senate for the December Student of the Month. Thank you very much to both of you. I appreciate that. Do we have any uh, comments or questions from trustees on the student trustee presentation? I have one. Um, those uh, coffee chats, how are those facilitated? I can start off and then Arabella can continue on that. Um, we created a Microsoft Forms that spoke a little bit to students' interests, some things just about them, and then we took those responses and we paired them with a different student from a different school for a chance for those students to just meet someone, create a friendship, and, and learn about that. And we wanted that networking to be there, even in a virtual conference. And Arabella and I experienced coffee chats at the OSTA conference um, back at uh, EGM. 
And so we really enjoyed that experience. We thought it would be great to bring, to, to create networking for students even virtually. So Arabella uh, was instrumental in creating that so she can speak a bit more to that. Yeah, so I think Isabel covered it pretty well, but we paired them up with someone, you know, they could choose if they want to meet someone from the city, the county, what position. We paired prime ministers with prime ministers if that was what they wanted, or deputy prime ministers with deputy prime ministers. And from there, they were sent an email, and the email had a bunch of questions. There was like this question generator they could pick if they needed conversation starters, and they could just talk and, you know, make a friend from somewhere in the board. So it was really awesome. I think that's excellent. Thank you guys very much. That's really, really cool. We could use that. <laughs> okay, uh, so moving on, uh, we did have delegations on our uh, um, on our agenda, but that item has been struck from the agenda, so we don't have any delegations um, this evening. We do have one person on the speakers list, and I believe she Point is uh, tuning in remotely. Point of order, Madam Chair. No, that only comes from the floor. I'm sorry. Well, I'd like to be on the speakers list. I would have signed up for the speakers list had I known. And I wasn't given that opportunity. We do have a, a, a deadline for the speakers list, and it's um, 15 minutes before the, the meeting has begun to make the speakers list. I sent an email on Friday that I'd like to speak at this board meeting. Did you send an email for the delegation or for the speakers list? For the delegation, I didn't think I needed to speak on the speakers list because I thought I would be able to speak tonight. I'd like the trustees to consider uh, allowing the president of 1,500 teachers in your board to speak on the issue. That's fine. And uh, is our other uh, delegation able to speak? So the speaker's list gets five minutes. I'll adjust my comments. Thank you. And the other speaker uh, who was delegating tonight, if we're all in favor of allowing them to speak, I'm happy to do that as well. I consensus Burgess. By consensus? I think we have consensus. Yes, thank you very much. And I thank you, uh, Mr. Spagnuolo, and you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, trustees, for allowing me the opportunity. Uh, I, would, I think people online and watching deserve an explanation as to why uh, this is not being reconsidered. And I, I would uh, hope we have an explanation more thorough than what was received at the beginning of this meeting. I think that would speak to transparency and openness by public school board trustees to their constituents. I'd like to uh, encourage you to reconsider the motion back in August on the masking issues uh, from kindergarten to grade three specifically. The issue is critical in our community. COVID cases continue to increase at an alarming rate. Trustees made the right decision by asking that students be requested to have masks mandatory on buses. Now the next logical step is requiring all students to be masked in our public elementary schools. I'd like to refer to the precautionary principle. In December 2006, a report by Justice Archie Campbell on the SARS outbreak spoke to this principle. It can be summarized as, where there's a reasonable evidence of impending threat to public harm, it is inappropriate to require proof of causation beyond a reasonable doubt before taking steps to avert the threat. That reasonable efforts to reduce risk need not await scientific proof. The health unit in a news, re news release today stated, based on the data, our case rates are comparable to the areas that are in lockdown. We are on the verge of having the local health system capacity get overwhelmed. What are we doing as a school system to support our community? We need to do something to protect the people in our schools our staff and our students, and further the families to whom they return to every evening. Primary class sizes are relatively the same as in years past. The teacher is masked, the support staff are masked, yet the children are not. If this same group were to attend a movie theater, a grocery store, or a public library, every individual would need to wear a mask. But because it's a school, there is no provincial mandate. This notion boggles the mind. Thankfully, some school boards have taken the prudent and cautious approach and insisted that all students wear masks in their schools. These boards include, but are not limited to, the largest school board in Canada, the Toronto District School Board, Ottawa French Catholic, Waterloo Public and Catholic, Peel Public, Limestone District, Tr Trillium Lakelands, Tame Valley, London Catholic, Upper Grand, and Halton School Board. 
The CDC in, in the United States advised that all children two years of age and older should wear a mask. The more layers we have, the safer our buildings can be. There is no risk-free solution when dealing with COVID, but trustees have an obligation, a moral obligation to mitigate. The American Academy of Pediatrics stated in August of 2020 that the use of cloth-based cloth-based coverings by children ages two years and up should be a part of all plans for a safe return to school. Their president stated, just like children understand that they must wear bicycle helmets and buckle their seatbelts, they will come to learn to wear masks routinely when necessary. Wearing a non-medical mask or face covering is especially important in indoor or crowded settings. Our schools are indoor and they're crowded. Locally, the case count for children from 0 to 19 was at 153 for every 100,000 people and was the lowest case count when compared to other age groups from March to August. Since school began in September, those numbers have increased to 246. Further, in the GTA, where a number of schools underwent voluntary testing for all students, 100% of those schools were closed and moved to virtual learning. This tells us that there is asymptomatic cases in our schools. Schools are a contributing factor to community spread. Further, according to David Fisman, a professor at the University of Toronto, he states that in Ontario, public health measures are starting to flatten the percent of positivity in all age groups, except in the age category of those 10 years and younger. I implore you, trustees, to make a decision that will protect the very people in, the, in your care. There's no financial cost to the school board and it benefits the system. It benefits the community. It benefits teachers, support staff and children and their families. Yet every, every day, thousands of children are being exposed for the majority of their waking hours to COVID-19 in their schools. Tonight, you're essentially being asked to reconsider a decision you made in August. Changing your vote should not be seen as a sign of weakness but rather a sign of strength. Adapting your decision-making based on new information and a changing context shows leadership. As professionals, we strive every day to improve. I want you to envision looking back in two or three years to our current pandemic, knowing you as decision-makers did all you could to protect staff, students, and the community. Would that not be a better feeling to have instead of looking back and knowing you could have done more? I implore you to side with safety and side with mandatory masking. And I ask that a trustee put forward a public motion to reconsider the decision so that we can see the public debate and not do it in private session. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker on our list is uh, Kristen Garrett Spanswick. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you for allowing me to the opportunity to speak to you this evening. My name is Kristen Garrett Spanswick, and I represent educational support staff in the Greater Essex County District School Board. My members support the daily learning and needs of students in junior and senior kindergarten, as well as students who are developmentally and behaviorally complex throughout all grade levels and programs in our system. They are early childhood educators, developmental service workers, educational assistants, support workers for the deaf and hard of hearing, child and youth workers, and temporary support staff, to name a few of the 16 job classifications that are part of the ESS bargaining unit. In the majority of work that the educational support staff members do, they find themselves unable to physically distance from students, which deems them to be high risk. Educational support staff are frontline workers in our educational system who support behaviorally aggressive students, students who spit, who bite, and ESS provide the toileting and clean, clean up bodily fluids for students each and every day. Although ESS, along with other staff, are being directed to wear shields in addition to their masks for the protection of themselves and those around them, in some cases, they are also wearing gloves and gowns. Yet many of the students we support do not wear a simple mask. This puts ESS, our students, and other staff we come in contact with at greater risk of exposure to COVID and other communicable illnesses. One of the main health and safety concerns of all union affiliates remains the increase in local case numbers and the balance of keeping 
staff and students safe. This must be a concern of the board as well. By having all students, unless medically exempt, wear masks in our schools, we would, as a board and a school community, be displaying an overarching strong signal to the rest of our community that we are doing everything to help keep those in our schools safer and in turn the rest of our community safer as we try to do our part to mitigate the spread of this virus. At the start of this pandemic just a few short months ago, it was thought that children were less susceptible to catching the virus and infecting those around them. However, we know that this may not be accurate. This is reflected in what we are seeing when it comes to positive cases in our board alone. The majority of cases have been in students. Were those students wearing masks? Would masks have helped limit these transmissions in our schools? We will not know. These details are not shared due to confidentiality. General COVID data suggests that the majority of cases are mild or asymptomatic, which only continues to spread when people go without a mask. We know that upon speaking, especially loudly, the virus is released into the air in the form of droplets. The louder one speaks, the more the virus spreads. The virus can remain for many hours in a room simply due to speaking without a mask and the droplets remaining on surfaces. Masks for all would help to mitigate this in our school. This pandemic is taking its toll on the mental health of those dealing firsthand with large groups of people, including children, who may pose a risk to one's health. Here in our board, all staff are feeling anxious and educational support staff are the most vulnerable when dealing daily with high-risk cohort mis mixing situations with many students that are not wearing masks. ESS are suited up in layers of personal protective equipment as mandated by the board to protect themselves and those around them, including students, but there has not been the same expectation of the board for all students in the system. We know that students get caught up in the wonderful activities and learning being presented to them in our schools. They forget how to use the proper cough protocol of coughing into their elbow. They may forget to wipe their nose and wash their hands immediately after. As a result, those droplets travel, posing a risk to their classmates, their teachers, their ESS, and others. Teachers, ESS, and others in buildings, including older students, are modeling the wearing of masks. Given that all students will now have to wear masks on the school buses, it seems like a natural transition for them to wear them inside our schools as well. Children are adaptable to new things, often more so than adults. With the right message and teachable moments, students will be proud to be part of a solution. Under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, the board has a responsibility to make the workplace that is our system as safe an environment as possible for staff. And it is a shame that there are inconsistent measures in large areas of this workplace where not everyone is required to wear a mask. This is not the same in the greater community as everyone is required to mask up prior to entry or no entry is permitted. We have entire classrooms where the only people wearing masks are the adults, where not a single student has a mask on. How is this helping to mitigate the risk for all? I have heard from many ESS members whose worst fear would be that a student in their care at school become exposed to the risk of the virus. They are doing everything in their power to minimize the risk to keep their students safe, but without students wearing masks as well, the risk level remains heightened. Ms. I understand Ms. Garrett Spanswick, I'm so sorry to interrupt, and I know that we've kind of done this to you on the fly here, but can you wrap up quickly? The speaker's list is five minutes, delegations are 10. I'm so sorry, if we can just wrap it up. Absolutely, I'm, I'm speaking as fast as I can. Um, I understand that the board's previous decision met the minimum guidelines set out by the government and ministries, but we can go beyond the minimum. We can do better, especially here in Greater Essex, where our local case numbers continue to rise. We need to collectively be part of the solution. You may feel that my comments, this is the end, you may feel that my comments about student safety is not part of my purview as a union leader, but the safety of educational support staff members is impacted by the safety practices set out for all. A student's learning environment is my member's working environment, and making it as safe as possible is my goal. I certainly hope it is the board's goal as well. As you, the trustees, consider the motion that had been put for you this evening, I would ask that you consider the health and safety of all students and staff within the GEC DSC community and what is in their best interest now so that we can all move forward from this pandemic sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that uh, quick adjustment there for time. Uh, and for trustees, we're going to go through, we have one more speaker on the speakers list, and then we'll open the floor for questions of our speakers. So we do have Chantal Meadows, 
on this speaker's list. Hello. Go ahead, Ms. Thank Meadow. you for having me. Thank you for having me. I'm speaking with you today to beg for you to reconsider K through three math in our school. I'm a proud mom of a five-year-old and an active community member. Masks are mandatory to go to the store, to attend doctor's appointments, attend in class for grade three to post-secondary school. In some places, masks and shields are required at all times. Masks should be required for K through three, just as they are in the public. Now, as children are bused to school as of January 1st, 2021, they will be required to wear a mask. But when they enter the school, it is not mandatory. How does this make sense? Schools have been closed, cohorts dismissed, families keeping their children home because of the mask protocol for K through three. We need to follow suit with the largest school board in the country, the Toronto District School Board, and make mask mandatory for K through 12. Multiple health units have supported other school boards on this same issue. Our numbers in Windsor and Essex County are rising. Our families and those most vulnerable are at risk, and the board can be part of the solution. Protecting our children means we are protecting our frontline workers as school outbreaks place pressure on our healthcare system. We need our children to be safe. We need our educators to be safe. We all want to be safe. This is one step that we can make to help. Please look at what others are doing. We're close to a potential lockdown in our community. Let me be very clear. I want to send my child to school and I want to send her knowing that my decision to have my grade one student wear a mask is supported by administration. But until a K through three mask policy is implemented, this support cannot happen because I quote, it is not mandatory, unquote. Having some educators tell students, quote, they don't have to wear a mask, unquote, when parents have requested it is unacceptable. As a parent, I value a public education and the professionals teaching and supporting our children. It truly takes a vi village to raise a child, but we need an equal opportunity to ensure the safety of our children with a consistent message of mandatory masks K through three. Please be part of the change Please have children K through three wear masks in our school. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Meadows, and thank you to all of our speakers. Do any trustees have questions for the speakers? Trustee Chi. Oh, th th uh I appreciate the, the three speakers who uh, gave their uh, information and uh, opinions. I really appreciate it. And I wonder if they know there is a recent research coming out that 35.0% uh, of kids with COVID-19 are asymptomatic. That means uh, over one third of the kids with COVID-19, they don't have any uh, symptoms with them, but they are in the schools and also in Toronto and uh, several schools volunteered to attend the COVID-19 uh, test. Trustee Chin, do we have a question? Yes, I, I, I wonder if they know that. And uh, the volunteer school, the first school, the, there are over 20, 20, 26 students and uh, they have a simple asymptomatic COVID-19 and it was closed. And the, the Chin, other Can we give the, the speakers a chance to answer your question? Yeah, I wonder if they, they know the, the figure. Thank you. Are you asking one speaker in particular? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, there was uh, Mr. Spagnuolo, yeah, me, Ms. Banswick, or Ms. Sorry, that's Mr. Spagnuolo. Her her mic was off. Uh, thank you, Tristine Chin, for the question. Uh, we're we are aware of what ha is happening in the Greater Toronto area, where our colleagues in those school boards. Uh, there was a pilot project where they did voluntary rapid testing and testing. And what you are absolutely correct, and the research is correct. Uh, they have found that children are asymptomatic and they're spreading the virus unknowingly. 
uh, not only in the schools, but bringing it home to their families. And that's why we support uh, mandatory masking in K-3, to because I don't think there's a person in the room that would want to do that. And if they could stop that by wearing a mask, they would. And we're just asking that students do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Cook? Hi. I have a question for Mario. Um, so you know that the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit is the one that has set the protocol. Um, we here as trustees, as I said earlier, I look around the room and I acknowledge people on the phone right now. You're not a doctor. You're not an infection specialist. Neither are we. So we here have chosen to follow the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. Um, I would like to know, Mario, do you know the consequences that can happen when a young child, K-3, to wears a mask? Have you looked at that? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Trustee Cook. And no, I'm not a doctor, and I would never want to uh, have, be in the position of a doctor like Dr. Ahmed. He has a lot on his plate. But what I do know is that other public health units have taken that position, and other school boards have taken the position of K-3 to wearing mandatory masks. Um, we also know that public health has changed their opinion over time during this pandemic. At one point, we were told not to wear masks in March. And that was, that's evolved. And that's not a criticism. That's the current situation we're in. We're learning as we go. It's a pandemic. And we, do, we need to adjust our, our strategies as we learn more. And so it would not be unreasonable, and I think the test of reasonableness is something that you need to consider as a trustee, it would not be unreasonable for you as a trustee to decide on mandatory masking because other jurisdictions have done that and other medical professionals have recommended that. Thank you. Supplemental. Sure. So I'm going to ask you again, Mario. Do you know the consequences of a K-3 to child wearing a mask all day? If you're asking for a medical opinion, I can't provide that to you. What I can tell you is other jurisdictions have taken this position, and I don't think you could answer that question from a medical point of view either. What I know is, from what I've read, is the benefits outweigh the risks. Trustee Hatfield? Oh, thank you. Just a point of information. I just think that typically we ask our questions after each delegation speaks or speaker speaks so that it's easier for us to address our questions to that person as opposed to remembering who said what along the way noted i thank you for that yes yes do i see any other questions of trustees to our speakers Thank you very much. There was a uh, a comment made by our, our, our first speaker, Mr. Spagnuolo Noano. I'd like to uh, clarify that the um, the statement that I made at the beginning of the meeting about the um, the motion not being on the floor tonight was not in private session. We open our meetings in public. They are not live streamed at that point, but we open our meetings in public and then we go into private. Before we go into private, we do an approval of the agenda. At approval of the agenda, uh, there were several um, motions that were presented and voted on by trustees, um, and the results of which were that L11 was struck from, from the agenda. So I wanted to make sure that that was, that was clarified for, for everyone if I wasn't clear about it at the beginning, and I apologize for um, my lack of clarity there. I hope that um, satisfies that. So thank you very much to our, our speakers this evening. We're moving forward then to um, new business. So we have at L1 um, a COVID-19 budget update. At the time of um, agenda prep, the recommendation was not um, included. Our um, business department was quite uh, busy working on this uh, to the wee hours of the morning and over the weekend. So I will read out the recommendation for those of us that are watching um, the live stream and don't have this um, portion of the agenda for themselves. It is a little bit lengthy, so I apologize for that. The recommendation that the board approve an additional operating deficit for purposes of the Ministry of Education compliance calculation of $4,168,891 
resulting in a total deficit for ministry compliance calculation of eight million four hundred twenty one six hundred forty seven thousand representing two percent of the board's operating allocation and that of the total deficit for compliance purposes of eight million four hundred twenty one thousand six hundred forty seven an amount of nine hundred fifty seven thousand one hundred ninety seven is to be used for the purposes of drawdown of accumulated capital surplus for amortization of committed capital projects funded directly by the board. The remaining total deficit in the amount of $7,464,450 is to be used to fund specified COVID-19 expenditures in which no direct ministry funding is available. And I look to administration to speak to the report. Superintendent Armstrong. Um, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Pardon me, I'm sorry. Now I have messed up procedurally. Thank you. I need a mover. Uh, Trustee Sipkar and Trustee Sartori, thank you so much. Did you just need your presentation too? Oh, presentation as well, yeah. Oh, we've got a, a PowerPoint? Yeah. I Wonderful. do, if I, if I could. And um, part, sorry, just to clarify, so trustees on the phone, do they have access to this PowerPoint as well? Yes. Yes. Okay, so trustees on the phone, we're going to be following along with the PowerPoint here, and I just want to make sure that you're able to follow along. I do apologize that um, you're getting this information a little bit later. We actually did have a report drafted and a recommendation, and then we had information from the ministry that came through Thursday afternoon, and it uh, resulted in reevaluating. Chantal uh, Meadows. Reevaluating the it's report. Now exiting. <laughs> uh, through you, Madam Chair, I'd just like to thank. Uh, Mr. Mayhew and uh, Superintendent Armstrong, that was a lot to turn around and uh, deal with in a weekend. So I just uh, want to say a huge shout out to you because I didn't know that you'd be, be able to get it all done. So thank you for that. No problem. Thank you. Uh, before I begin the presentation, I would like to, to thank Mr. Mayhew, who is our manager of facility services, sorry, financial services, they're alike, <laughs> but not. Uh, for his efforts in advancing the work on the board's revised estimate submission. And this allowed us to provide you tonight with a financial update related to COVID-19. Sean's hard work, commitment, and attention to detail were very instrumental, and I greatly appreciate him and the work that he does. So tonight, I wanted just to provide you a high level with a background, some information with respect to the COVID-19 funding updates since our last discussion, a revised projection on expenditures related to COVID-19, a financial summary and a quick discussion on our accumulated surplus, and then a discussion about risks and opportunities which led to the recommendation which Madam Chairperson just read. So in terms of the background, how did we get here? In response to community spread of COVID-19 in Ontario, the provincial government announced the closure of all publicly funded schools on March 13, 2020. The school closure order was extended to the end of June 2020, resulting in all students participating in distance learning. On July 30, 2020, the provincial government issued its Guide to Reopening Ontario Schools to support the safe reopening of schools for the 2020-21 school year. This guidance was developed on the principles of providing safe and healthy school environments for staff and students, providing high quality education for every student, addressing gaps in student learning, mental health and well-being as a result of the school closures last year, and maintaining close communication with parents and reducing barriers for their return to work. The province identified our board as a designated school board requiring its secondary students to open under an adapted model with class cohorts not to exceed 15 students and with alternating schedules with at least 50% of in-class in -class instruction. The provincial guidance also provided specific directions over health and safety, cleaning standards and protocols, and some funding investments. Shortly after the uh, release of the guidance, on August 11, 2020, the board approved its 2020-21 budget, reflecting announced COVID funding at that time of $1,866,140 and COVID-related expenditures of $5,161,699, resulting in using a deficit 
and using the board's accumulated surplus representing approximately 1% of its operating allocation and that amount on the on the uh, recommendation was $3,295,559. On October the 6th, 2020, administration provided the board with a COVID-19 financial update at its operations and finance standing committee meeting, noting the preliminary nature of those project projections due to limited data associated with the reopening of schools. At that meeting, administration committed to providing the board with a further COVID-19 financial update in conjunction with the revised estimate submission to the ministry, which is due next week. So now I'd just like to update you in terms of funding announcements that we have received uh, since our last discussions. To support the financial challenges of school boards in reopening its schools and implementing the necessary measures outlined in the province's guide to reopening Ontario schools, a number of funding announcements were made by the Ministry from August 2020 to current. On October the 2nd, 2020, the Ministry announced amendments to Ontario Regulation 280, subsection 19, to provide legal authority for boards to have greater access to their accumulated surpluses without first obtaining Ministry approval. These amendments include, for the 2020-21 school year only, School boards may incur an in-year deficit of the lower of 2% of the board's operating allocation and the accumulated surplus balance if it's incurred for reasons related to COVID-19 and it removed the requirement for the in-year deficit elimination plan. Based on the amendments to the regulation, the board may utilize 2% of its operating allocation, which is estimated to be $8,421,647 from its accumulated surplus to address COVID-related 19 expenditures. On November 26, 2020, in response to unexpected enrollment declines experienced by school boards due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and which did not inform the development of school board budgets, the Ministry announced a one-time funding stabilization for the 2020-21 school year through the establishment of a GSN funding floor. The one-time funding stabilization is subject to certain regulations being made by the Lieutenant Governor and Council under the Education Act. On November 26, 2020, the Ministry also announced COVID-19 funding for additional high-priority areas and funding for the Education and Community Partnership Program. Funding for the additional high-priority areas was allocated to those school boards whose geographic region was experiencing higher rates of COVID-19 community transmission. There were two separate announcements that were made for this funding. However, our board was not allocated funding under this initiative. The Ministry, as I mentioned, also introduced a one-time investment for the Education and Community Partnership Program to fund technology and technology-related costs to support continued student learning. Our board was allocated $29,182 under this program. In conjunction with its revised estimate submission, the board is projecting an enrollment decline of 174 elementary students and zero secondary students from its original budget submission. The declining enrollment is a consideration in the ministry's calculation of the, of the board's GSN floor amount. On December 3, 2020, the Ministry provided the Board with a template to calculate the projected floor amount. Based on the Ministry's template, the Board is anticipating a GSN stabilization grant of $4,162,958, which reasonably approximates 1% of the Board's operating allocation. However, it should be noted that no guidance has been provided by the Ministry as to how the GSN stabilization grant may be utilized. These next few slides will provide a summary of all the, the COVID-19 funding that's been announced and allocated to the board to date. This first slide will show the GSN funding that's been received for COVID-19 related purposes. And again, this is tied to enrollment. So if we have enrollment changes, this funding will either increase or decrease. 
The next three slides outline the PPF funding the board has been allocated for COVID-19 purposes. So for the slide on this page, this addresses the investments to support school reopening. So for example, there's funding for additional custodians, health and safety training for our occasional teachers, funding for additional teaching staff, remote learning, temporary hiring of non-permanent teaching staff, again, additional funds for remote learning, and uh, flexibility with the re, uh, reopening emerging issues. This next slide highlights the PPF funding that's related to system supports and efficiencies. And you'll see that there on the slide. And this slide addresses funding for student mental health and special education, again, related to COVID-19. The total PPF funding, which is the aggregate of those three slides, is $7,537,526. And when you put them together with the G COVID GSN funding that we um, have received of $4,567,515, plus the PPF funding that I just mentioned, we have total funding of $12,105,041 to support COVID-19 related expenditures. It is very important to note that this funding is enveloped and there's specific criteria in terms of how it may be utilized. Now I'd like to give you um, uh, just a brief update again on our updated projections for COVID-19. In conjunction with the reopening of schools, the board anticipates incurring incremental costs associated with a number of measures, including personal protective equipment, technology internet and IT staffing, additional teaching support and administrative staff to support our virtual schools, filters and incremental utility charges for changes to ventilation systems, occasional staffing costs, custodial and enhanced cleaning measures, and student transportation. The incremental expenditures are, are necessary to meet the directives under the province's guide to reopening Ontario schools, guidance from the public health authorities, and the board's COVID-19 safety plans. The next several slides will outline the updated COVID-19 expenditures projections. This slide outlines the projected incremental staffing costs associated with COVID-19. You'll see there are additional elementary teachers and secondary teachers, re-engagement counselors. There's our virtual school administration that has, is incremental as well. Our technology enabled learning contracts, IT tech support, software support and help desk teams, casual custodians, and funding for the health and safety training that our occasional staff took at the beginning of September. The total incremental, projected incremental staffing cost is $8,110,440. This slide outlines the incremental technology costs. costs. These are exclusive of staffing, which was mentioned on the previous slide. And these costs are required to support the system through the COVID-19 pandemic. And you'll note that the total incremental technology costs are $4,157,182. That includes um, the procurement of 6,200 student devices. These are commitments, so the purchase orders have been um, submitted for that. So these are committed costs. Other costs, these are other costs that are associated with supporting the system, uh, mostly from a facility standpoint. And I've highlighted those on this schedule. The PPE costs, those are costs that we've primarily already incurred at the beginning of the school year uh, to ensure that we had all the appropriate PPE supplies on hand uh, before the start of school. The ventilation, the air purifiers, we have specific funding related to that. So this cost, cost offsets that, as well as costs for filters, higher utility costs because of the way we're running our ventilation systems, Disinfected and cleaning, there is specific funding from the ministry for that. And there was some minor building reconfiguration costs um, that occurred after uh, August 31st. We did a lot of that work, obviously, before school started. 
This slide outlines the student transportation costs related to the early release of secondary students, disinfecting school buses and PPE for drivers. You'll notice that there are some route savings identified on this schedule and this is primarily due to the fact that there are fewer pieces of equipment that are being used because the number of riders on the buses obviously are lower. And that cost net of the savings is 252910 When you aggregate all these slides, the total COVID-19 projected expenditures are $15,406,533. So I guess now that we've gone through funding and through the expenditures, what does this mean in terms of the overall summary and our accumulated surplus? On August the 11th, 2020, the board approved a deficit to address COVID-19 expenses in the amount of $3,295,559, this representing approximately 1% of its operating allocation. The board's current funding, plus the use of the 1% of its operating allocation, closely approximates the projected COVID-19 expenses. It's a small shortfall of about $6,000. However, it should be noted that the projection is based on a set of assumptions and circumstances which could change. It may be necessary for the board to utilize a portion of its additional 1% of its operating allocation to fund any potential differences. And I'll discuss this further when we take a look at the risks and the opportunities. In terms of our accumulated surplus, the board maintains a healthy accumulated operating surplus balance due to thoughtful and prudent management of its financial resources. As a result of the school closure order in 2019-20, the board realized a higher than expected in-year surplus due to unspent GSN funding. So you'll note that we closed the year at August 31st with an operating surplus of $29,868,000. This slide highlights the implications to the board's accumulated surplus if we use the 1% of it with the use of the 1% of the operating allocation, which has been approved by the board. So we start the year with 29,868,000 of our um, operating accumulated surplus. We reduce it by the 3,295,559. So we would end the year at $26,572,000. That again assumes that um, our spending and our revenue in the year itself nets to zero. And so we have no deficit or we have no surplus. If we use 2%, mm -hmm. you start at the same point at the 29,868, and then we're gonna add the additional 1%. So we're gonna use 7,465,000. So we're gonna end the year projected at $22,403,000, which is, is still a pretty decent balance. Some other things that we need to consider um, and that informed you know, our recommendation to you. The impact of the COVID, of the pandemic on the board is fluid and we need to pivot or adjust to changing circumstances and projected expenditures will similarly be affected. Additional considerations which may have a negative impact on the COVID expense projection include changes by students of their learning models. In this instance, students will have the opportunity to make another change to their learning model in January of 2021. Given the state of the pandemic in our community, it is anticipated that many students may choose to change their learning model. This will result in impacts to staffing and classroom reorganization, the costs of which are not reasonably estimated at this time. The state of the pandemic itself is another consideration. As case counts grow in the province and across our community, the board may be required to change its learning models, which will influence the nature and the amount of COVID-related expenditures being incurred. Procurement of PPE is another consideration. The board has assumed that the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services will continue to provide PPE at no cost to the board. Is now exiting. Should the board be required to fund its own PPE based on analysis of usage and types of PPE required? Incremental monthly costs 
are expected to be $120,000 per month. This would, is not included in this projection. Enrollment is another consideration as well. Based on the October 31st, 2020 count date, enrollment has declined over the original budget by 174 full-time equivalent students in the elementary panel. Further enrollment changes at the March 1st count date may impact overall GSN grants, including the GSN-based COVID funding. In terms of occasional supply costs, at this time it doesn't appear to be trending over budget. However, depending on the rate of community spread of COVID-19, a 10% increase in absenteeism rates would result in an incremental increase to occasional supply costs of $1 million, which is not included in this projection. It is difficult to anticipate how COVID-19 will affect future absenteeism rates. And the last consideration, second last consideration, sorry, funding is enveloped. So the envelope nature of the funding, both the GSN and the PPFs, provides less flexibility to the board in addressing its unique circumstances. And then, of course, there are the changes of the underlying assumptions that inform the projections that we provided with you today. It's not all bad news, however, there are some opportunities. <laughs> I would like to thank our senior team who examined their budgets in detail to identify potential opportunities to assist with unfunded COVID related expenditures. Approximately $538,000 within existing operating budgets has been identified for potential redirection to COVID expenditures where required. These budget opportunities pertain primarily to anticipated savings in professional development because we can do that virtually now and athletic expenditures, which unfortunately we're not doing right now. And then that leads us obviously to the recommendation. The board has developed its projection of COVID-19 expenditures using assumptions, which may be subject to change depending on the state and development of the pandemic, both locally and provincially. Announced funding to, to date together with the utilization of 1% of the board's operating allocation, reasonably approximates the projected COVID-19 expenditures. However, should additional information or factors become known, the board will be limited in terms of, of its response to those changes. As such, it is recommended that the board consider approving the use of the additional 1% of its operating allocation to provide flexibility should there be negative changes to the COVID-19 projection and in which there is no direct ministry funding available to offset the incremental expenditures. Administration will continue to manage the board's financial resources prudently and responsibly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Armstrong, and thank you as well to your team. Um, for this exceptional work on our behalf. Thank you. Um, and for giving this information to trustees. Do I, I do have a list of, um, of questioners. So I have, uh, I'll recognize trustees as we go around the room, but there are uh, a little bit of a list right now. So I have trustee Burgess first. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just unmuted. Um, my question, I think, was was a while ago on uh, slide 10, um, and it was about the FCE enrollment decline and its effect on re revised estimates and obviously funding. Uh, we are down 174 full-time equivalent in the elementary panel. Um, because we just got this afternoon, I can't compare that to earlier uh, reorg dates or whatever. Um, is that um, unusual? And can you tell us why? Does it have anything to do with withdrawal of students from the system to homeschool or what? Through you, Madam Chair. Yes, I believe it would be um, definitely a lower number than we have um, in the past, uh, sorry, a higher number than we've had in the past in terms of um, over, under projection, over our projections. 
Um, what it, I think it is is some homeschooling, the choice in some cases to homeschool. When we look at those numbers, that would have affected that. So yes, I do believe the pandemic and uh, the learning situation has affected that. That has been a phenomenon that I think has been seen around the province. Supplemental. Right, so it's, Madam Chair, supplemental. Go ahead. It's not on the recommendation per se, but it is on that. Um, so how are we supporting those folks who have withdrawn, who possibly have gone to homeschooling, when we are offering paper packages, for example, and online and obviously in person? So how are we supporting them when, when they should per be encouraged to say, sign on to our paper pack? Through you, Madam Chair, yes, there has been encouragement by our re-engagement counselors and our social workers. There have been, I know through uh, Dr. Pike's office, been a number of contacts to encourage that, but people do make their choices. Uh, we are always uh, reaching out to see if there's an alternative that we can provide, but I think it's a reality of the context that we're in. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Trustee Sipkar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I'd like to understand this from a procedural perspective. Um, I made note on the first page of the report that um, we have already approved 1% of our surplus, but there was no mention of a, a defeated motion that had already occurred. And I, uh, from a procedural perspective, as we have been debating motions that have been brought forward um, from pa previous meetings, I'd like to understand as the mover of this current motion, how this one is in order when essentially I think the intent of the first paragraph is asking the same thing. Um, so I'd like, I'd like a, an understanding from administration about how we can bring forward the same motion again um, several months later. It I, I, knew, I do know what you're indicating. Uh, I do recall, though, we said that we would bring something back to the board at revised estimates if there was a need for additional funding, that we would be bringing that back. I, I looked to Superintendent Armstrong, who has much more recall, I'm sure, because she was intimately involved. I'm not sure about the recall part, but um, if I recall, um, I thought the request for the additional 1% was to provide for smaller class sizes or for elementary teachers. We're not asking for that. We're asking to use the 1% for additional COVID-related expenses. If I recall, I don't have it in front of me. Trustee Sikar, follow-up? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, so I noted, though, that on page 4 of 7, that you do note that staffing is a part of the COVID expenditure projection, specifically elementary teachers, for a total of $3.2 million. Um, I did look back at the motion. It does say to address class sizes. Would you not agree, though, that part of the money that we're asking to, that you're asking us to approve tonight would potentially be going to staffing at the elementary level as well? Potentially, yes. We have staff, we have funding from the ministry that allows us to do some hiring of, of permanent positions for teachers. We also have re-emerging issues funding that we could redirect because that's, we have flexibility in terms of that. But yes, some of that additional 1% could be for teachers, but it could also be for change our utilities costs. It can also be used for PPE, for ventilation, for filters. There's a number of items that we could be using the additional 1% for in which there's no funding or not enough funding. Trustee Apple, do you have a point of information? I do. So as I recall, the uh, motion that was defeated to... Um, to use the 2% was uh, at a time when we didn't know our expenses. So it was, um, let's use up to what we can use, the, the full 2%, and that was defeated. And I don't think that this is an identical motion because now it's with data, with information, and now we're in the hole, and now we need to resort to that. Uh, so I don't think they're... Uh, they're identical motions. I think that they're distinct. Trustee Sokar, do you have a follow-up? I have other questions, but I'll save them for round two. Yeah, I'll put you on the list. Yes, uh, Trustee Hatfield, thank you for that. I think um, there was a, a motion at the uh, at budget time, uh, actually moved by Trustee Sartori and seconded by myself, asking for um, 
uh, a revision to come back to the board. And I believe this is what we're seeing the answer to that. Um, Although I, I, I do appreciate and I thank you very much for that clarification because it was um, a defeated motion and we've we've discussed that earlier and so I do appreciate that clarification. Trustee Haberstadt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, yeah, I'd like to ask uh, the communications officer that the board uh, voted in favor of back a couple of months ago. It was originally um, uh, targeted for uh, provincial money. Uh, COVID money. Just wondering if uh, that happened, and if not, what is the, where is that money going, or where is it being found? Sorry, that is not in this projection because it is not a COVID-related expense. So that 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 is not in this projection. And when we we have we're still finalizing the revised estimates that are submitted to the ministry. And when we come to the ops and finance committee meeting in February, we typically bring a report that discusses changes in revised estimates to original estimates, and we'll be able to discuss that at this time. But it is not in this projection. Okay, is the is the officer hired yet, or no? That's in the works. So that would that would be before the February meeting then. That's the hope. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just with regard to reducing class size. Trustee Halberstadt, is this a second question? I'll put you back on the list, but we'll move forward. Thank you. Trustee Hatfield. Thank you. And I'd like to be on the list again because I have two questions. So my first question um, is about uh, revenues that aren't specifically addressed in the report, but um, we have uh, many groups that have agreements uh, for gym rentals throughout our system that is a source of some revenue. And um, I'm assuming that all those activities have been cancelled since probably March. And um, there are federal programs that have been helping organizations that had rent commitments and I'm wondering what happened in our case. Did we just no activity equals no rent money or were we able to access any um, grants to substitute for that loss in revenue or is it a total uh, loss? And if so, uh, how much might, might that be? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, we run those programs on a cost recovery basis. So whatever um, whatever custodial costs or, or additional costs that we would incur for those rentals would equal the amount of the revenue. So there's no impact for purposes of this report. Um, when we do the revised estimates um, submission and we bring that forward to the operate, Operations Finance Committee in February, you'll be able to see where the rental revenue has decreased. Um, we have chosen to pause all community use of schools and rentals right now through to June 2021, unless something changes with respect to um, with respect to the state of the pandemic. So I'm at the end of our first round here. I just wanted to offer trustees an opportunity to ask their first question if they had one at this time. Uh, and then I will move for Trustee Burgess. I just wanted to let you know that I have your um, uh, your notation here. Trustee Sipcar will be first, and then you will be on deck. So Trustee Sipcar, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly because I was reading this over several times today. Um, on page five of seven, am I clear in understanding that at the that we have an in-year surplus of ten million dollars? And therefore, we'd be putting at our we'd be putting our surplus. This was last year, sorry, that we'd be putting our surplus at twenty nine million. So we're actually increasing our surplus amount, like, or we have increased our surplus amount in twenty in twenty twenty, like last last calendar year. That's am I correct in that? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm an accountant, so I you know I think yeah. <laughs> I think differently. Um, yes, last year when we finished the fiscal year end at August thirty first because of unspent GSN funding that we had related to the school closure orders, the ministry did not claw back that funding. So we had revenues that exceeded our expenses of 10,127,000, which increased our operating surplus, our accumulated surplus on the balance sheet. And so what, what we're saying now is we've got that increase to start our fiscal year now because we, 
we had that additional surplus from last year. And with the 1% that's already been approved, we're going to use $3.2 million of the, of the amount that's carried forward at the beginning of the year. And there's a recommendation or request to do an additional 1% that will bring us down to, at the end of the year, $22 million. Have I answered that or no? <laughs> Yes, but what, what stands out to me is that we're actually sitting in a better financial position than we were last year. Is that is that an accurate statement? That is correct because of the unspent GSN funding. Trustee Burgess, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to make clear that um, I, when I first saw this, I, I don't abstain very often. <laughs> I mean, I can count on one hand, probably a couple of fingers even. Uh, in the 20 years that I've ever abstained. But this is just a lot of information to receive just hours before uh, deliberating on a, on a recommendation. Um, and it has consequences. I want to thank the work. The work is enormous, and, I, and it didn't happen during business hours, Monday to Friday. I can see that. I appreciate that. But when I was listening to the recommendation and looking at the slide, I didn't hear the same words. Have there been additional words to the recommendation, or was that just narrative? I think uh, Superintendent Armstrong was just adding commentary, and most of that was contained within the report. Okay, so it's an additional word that was added to for, for commentary and for whatever, but everything that was spoken is in this recommendation that I'm looking at on a PowerPoint. Yes. Okay. And Madam Chair, if I could, um, if you uh, go to Section 37 and our rules, reconsideration, I just want to say, um, because I can't honestly remember where I was uh, on what day in July or August that we moved the budget and as far as the 2%, but um, it says very clearly in Roberts, the purpose of reconsidering a vote is to permit correction of hasty, ill-advised, or erroneous action, or to take into account added information or a changed situation that has developed since the taking of the vote. So it's all in order. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Burgess. Uh, Trustee Halberstadt. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm on the same topic as far as reducing class size. Um, what would it take if we used um, the surplus money to reduce uh, to reduce class sizes in elementary? Um, what are the risks of doing that, if, if there are risks? I can begin that. Maybe then I look to uh, Superintendent Mills. Uh, obviously, we have changed modes of learning and class, uh, classes for students a number of times, and we will be once again changing that in January. So even when we do change classes, it is disruptive to students and to teachers, um, and we will have to, uh, again, go through that in January. So again, it creates a disruption, and uh, people like the when they have a teacher, and that teacher is consistent. So any change uh, there is, um, is difficult for us and to anticipate. For example, in January, we won't know necessarily how those numbers will go. Uh, we have added, as you notice in the elementary panel, I think 32 teachers to date, and if we do see uh, situations, we have added. But I looked at Superintendent Mills, who may be able to ask for that. Of course, there is a huge cost to that, but again, the disruption of consistency of teachers and finding teachers uh, could also be another anticipated issue. Yeah, further to what the uh, director is saying, yes, uh, we're, we're not sure what, what it's going to hold in, in January, uh, but certainly we are anticipating some movement uh, uh, for our students. Uh, part of the issue becomes uh, classes like our specialized programs, rise and gains classrooms. We can't close a classroom uh, in a brick and mortar building uh, because a few students leave, so that's an additional cost. So um, uh, we uh, add the teachers where, where necessary, and we've uh, just spoken to the director on a number of occasions to, to help with those. It, just one thing I thought of too is, of course, sometimes space would be an issue. If you split class size, you have to have more space for those students. And in some of our buildings, that would most certainly be a challenge. Uh, but when, where there's uh, class things, we will be revisiting that again in January. And certainly, we'll look to, to see what we can uh, do to accommodate some of that. But again, uh, that, that is a fair bit of uh, reorganization for families. 
we have a supplemental trustee Halberstadt. Yeah, so we, we have, with what you've just said, we, we have reduced the class sizes from the last time we took a look at it. Uh, from from uh, quad one to quad two, the uh, class sizes stayed very similar. Uh, so when we look at our class size averages, they remain uh, in primary, they are just under 20. In junior intermediate, they're just over 23. And our FTK are at about 22 and a half. Uh, when we look at average class sizes, those are very comparable to our first quad. Yeah, but some can go up to 30, 30 students, right, some classes? No, we don't have any any of the, those class sizes in our board. What is the upper level? Uh, right now, we're we're in most classes. Uh, in some of our larger classes, I would say would be more around twenty-seven. Thank you, Trustee Hatfield, with your second. Thank you. If in the presentation there was an amount identified, um, sorry, I didn't write it down, but I think it was around twenty-seven thousand dollars. It's pretty close. Uh, for PPE for bus drivers and I just was a little bit confused because bus drivers are employed by the bus company so I wasn't aware that we were providing PPE for non-employees so maybe somebody could explain that one to me and um, and then um, well first first that part and then I'll I, I'd like to know if if our board is contributing, did all boards contribute, and why are we contributing uh, when bus drivers aren't our employees? Okay, thank you for that. Um, okay, let me get my thoughts straight. Um, so the board, as the banker board, procures the PPE for the entire transportation consortium, okay? So we primarily do that through the MGCS, Ministry of Consumer, Government and Consumer Services, which is cost neutral. As I explained with the board's PP, we did incur some costs with respect to procuring locally so that we could supply everybody. The board, they're not, you're correct, they're not our employees. However, their costs of running the, the consortium are split amongst the four boards that participate in the consortium based on a percentage of ridership. So even though they're not our employees, the fact that they need PPE in order to run this, the busing for the students, our board has to pay, pay its proportionate share of that cost. So that's what that cost reflects. And there also is ministry funding um, assigned to um, PPE for student transportation and for buses, which would primarily offset that cost. Supplemental, Trustee Affield. Sorry, I, I'm still confused. So why is the consortium responsible for the expenses related to non-employees? Like, uh, we pay for their PPE, do we pay for anything else for them? Like, I, I don't understand why their employer isn't responsible. Like I'm, I'm confused by that. Um, we have an operating agreement by the four boards that um, are part of the transportation consortium. And we receive funding from the Ministry for Student Transportation, which flows to the consortium. And the related expenses are billed out. Like it, it's, it's, it's cost sharing. So all the boards pay the cost. It could be we pay a proportionate share of the driver's wages for their PPE. There's, there's formulas within the agreement. So I'm at our uh, second round of questioning. I know Trustee Sipkar has uh, another question she would like to ask. Uh, Trustee Sipkar, if you'd permit, I have a question that I would like to ask. Um, and my question was, uh, and we, we briefly referred to it in the in the presentation about the um, high priority funding. So there are two outstanding potential funds that could still come into us. One is that high priority funding that just for notification's sake was extended to boards at the beginning of the pandemic who were at a higher risk. We were not at that point in a higher risk, although there is some precedent for that funding to be extended to boards. Um, and then there is the second tranche of federal funding, which we have no idea how the provincial uh, government is looking to uh, to spend that or to divide it up or when, uh, if it will be enveloped, any of those things. So um, 
knowing that there's those two outs outstanding potential uh, funding sources, how does that affect our use of this additional 1% now? Um, it's hard to answer because I don't know how much funding potentially that we could get under either of those two scenarios that would be allocated to the board. So I don't know. We could, If we get additional funding, then... You know, it's incremental, obviously, to the additional 1%, but at the same time, the expenses, the projection is based on assumptions, and those assumptions could also change and adjust the, you know, adjust the costs as well. So it's, it's a difficult question to answer. And so these, these projections that are in there now are, are what or what administration is feeling like we need right now, irrespective of the things we don't know, that we need now in order to continue. Um, I'm gathering that. Um, however, Trustee Sipcar brought up a point that, that we are in a good financial position. And so using this additional 1% um, and, and putting it in um, into play allows us to spend for things that are not enveloped which is helpful for us um but if these potential funding sources come in and and would satisfy those funds and are not enveloped what happens to that additional one percent that we have now put in to the coffers that we can spend what happens to that we wouldn't use it I think that the it, the challenge is that we're going to be submitting a revised estimate submission to the ministry next week. And so if we want an opportunity to say we want to incur the additional 1%, now's the time to make the decision in order to do that. Um, some of these costs, like, you know, for example, the elementary teachers, the secondary teachers, those teachers are hired and in place. So those are good numbers. Are we going to hire more or will we have a requirement to hire more? It's hard to say until we know what happens with the change in learning models. Um, the estimates on the, on the um, utility costs are, are, again, an estimate only. It could come in higher, it could come in lower. So we're just trying to suggest that we may need an avenue to have some flexibility in case these projections that we are providing, which we feel reasonably confident about at this time, unless there's changes in circumstances that might influence that. If there's potential additional pots of money through that high and urgent priority area or the federal funding for that second tranche, that helps, um, then we don't use the additional 1%. We just don't spend it, but at least we're, we would budget for it through the ministry's revised estimates. Thank you. Trustee Sipcar. Madam Chair, it's Sean Mayu. Uh, just one comment to make about uh, the, the 1% as well. One of the biggest costs you'll see in here as well, aside from the additional teachers, is the classroom technology. There's over $3 million budget alone for classroom technology. Those items aren't specifically funded. Um, we, we have to use one, our 1% or a, a combination of the 1% and the other 1% for that money because we would capitalize those te that technology and defer it and then expense it over its remaining use of life. And we're not allowed to do that with the current funding being provided under the PPFs for COVID. So that's one big risk area here, uh, just the, the technology to keep that in mind. And, in, and that seems to be increasing as we go along. Thank you, Mr. Mayhew. Uh, Trustee Sukar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around um, basically how we can use all the resources that we have available to um, uh, deal with this pandemic. And I understand that our, our schools were closed for a significant portion of last year, and there's par probably that's partially to understand why we have an increased surplus. But I'm trying to wrap my mind around um, on page two, um, you indicate that there's amendments um, to a couple regulation provincial regulations and one of them it says for 2021 only school boards may incur an in-year deficit of the lower of 2% of a board's operating allocation and the accumulated surplus balance if it's incurred for reasons related to COVID. Could you explain what the, the accumulated surplus balance means? What that looks like for us? Of course, thank you. 
Um, the accumulated surplus balance, if you look on page five of seven, our accumulated operating surplus balance is $29,868,000. And then the 2% of our operating allocation, which is based on the GSN funding that we get from the ministry, is the 8.4 million. So the lower of those two numbers is the 8.4 million. That's all we can use, regardless of the fact that we have 29 million on the balance sheet as an accumulated surplus. If we go any further than that 8.4 million, then we need to go to the ministry for approval and we would have to file a deficit recovery plan. Again, regardless of the amount that's sitting on the balance sheet. Thank you, and I appreciate that explanation. And but it does say that there is a removable a removal of the requirement for an in-year deficit elimination plan. So if we were to go to going to the ministry, is that is that what that is referring to? The removal is if you want to go to two percent. Right now, the way the regulations are, are were currently written, if you you could use up to one percent with no requirement for the el deficit elimination plan. Now that regulation has changed to say you can go to 2% for COVID-related purposes and not file the deficit recovery plan and you don't need the ministry's approval. If we were to go any more than that, then we have to file the deficit recovery. So it might be just the way I've worded it in this memo that's not clear. I'm sorry for that. Thank you. I, I do appreciate that. I guess I just have one final question, and this can be something that is maybe even for a future Operations and Finance Committee meeting. Would we ever go past that 2% and, and file that with the ministry, especially in the time of, of a pandemic? For me as the director, I would not be comfortable with doing that. It is our job to stay in line with the budget. And uh, we have worked very hard to manage the budget. And I trust um, our uh, finance staff in particular to, to do that. I don't see us doing that. It's not a good position that a board wants to be in. Uh, and then we would become probably a higher risk board. And uh, we've worked hard to get ourselves in a good financial position. Very proud of that. And thank you to Superintendent uh, Shamihu for that work to get us there. Thank you very much. I do have one last question to wrap it up and then we'll call the question. Um, and it was kind of prompted to me by, by something I'd heard about in the presentation and then by Mr. Mayhew. So thank you very much. Um, knowing that we have this uh, 6,200 student devices, which is on page four of seven, um, and what's currently in our system in this. So what's currently in our system and this additional 6,200 devices uh, from a, a device to student ratio, how, what does that get us closer to? Uh, so one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at supporting our students at, at the virtual school. Uh, so uh, we've, since the beginning of the closure, we've probably handed out close to 7,500 devices that have uh, been handed out to our families in need. Um, we recently did a technology questionnaire to, to say that if we were in fully virtual mode, how many people would need devices? So we will always want to be prepared for that. Uh, we're looking at about another 2,500 families uh, or students that would be in need of devices at the elementary level. Um, so we also are preparing for that. Um, I know our technology is very limited in the elementary schools right now. Uh, we've just started to get those back into our compensatory education schools first. And uh, once we've imaged uh, uh, some of the uh, inventory that we have on hand, we're going to get those devices back, get devices back into, into schools. Uh, so as a ratio right now, there's a lot that we have out in the community. I don't, I couldn't give you an exact number, uh, but we have a lot that are supporting our students out in the community right now. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and thank you for that thorough answer because that was gonna kind of be my follow-up was, was if we are, as has been mentioned many, many times tonight, and I think rightly so, um, we're looking at how community spread right now and the potential um, that learning models could change for all. Um, and so where people were answering that survey with a perception in mind of, of not needing a, a device, there could be a higher need for devices in our communities. Um, and, and it being a, an electronic form, there could be some people that it, that it missed as well. And so I wanna make sure that we are, um, just as you said, doing everything we can to make sure that our, that our students have what they need, that our families have what they need if we had to shift. Um, and I know the board's done a, gr a great job of, of thinking of this agilely and, and preparing for those things. And, uh, and I just wanted to make sure that on that front, um, that we're, uh, we're cognizant of that. And, and there is an expense to it significant expense to it um and i want us to be um uh, fiscally responsible in that 
and also uh, with a focus to, to what we need now and what we may need. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Dr. Kelly? If I could add to that, uh, Superintendent Mills uh, and uh, Superintendent Armstrong and I talk quite a bit about technology and the needs and being prepared. And uh, that is, I think, one of the reasons for our 1% uh, request. We want all students to be prepared and uh, we want to make sure that we're ready should that happen. Thank you very much. So trustees, I am going to call the vote. And out of respect for our trusty colleagues on the phone, I'm going to um, allow them to uh, unmute themselves now. Um, and, or you can send your, uh, or your vote by uh, electronic means to Trusty Cook. Um, but I'm going to call the question. So all in favor of the recommendation as it is um, from administration. So looking for hands. Support. Thank you. I and believe Trustee Olmstead was having difficulty with her phone. Thank you, Support. Trustee. Thank you, Trustee Olmstead, and thank you, Trustee Burgess. I appreciate that. Okay, so that passes. Uh, moving forward then to L2. We have quite a few policies tonight. Um, and so we have our first one here at L2, policy and regulation, health and safety, workplace violence, and workplace harassment. I need a mover for that. Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Sipcar. Any discussion on that? No changes. <laughs> no changes. Okay, so seeing none and hearing none, um, I'm, I'm cognizant that we are trying to move this along quickly, but I, I also want to acknowledge that, that there is a, a little bit of a difference between our, our remote attendees as well, and I don't want to move too quickly and uh, disclude them unnecessarily. Um, so moving to L3, policy and regulation, student trust. Oh, I'm, I'm moving too fast. Support for that policy. Thank you, and thank you for keeping me on track. Moving forward, policy and regulation, student trustee looking for a mover. Cook and Sartori for the second. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Uh, trustee Sipkar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in conversation with the Trustee Hatfield on handwritten 39. Um, there's a request to add the words um, number five at the very end. It says a GEC DSB staff member. Um, there was a request to add with direct involvement in education of the student um, so that it is clear that it is a staff member that has had experience um, with, this, uh, with this student and not just somebody random in the board. Um, and so I'm asking for that as a friendly and then um, uh, then the, move the policy as amended. I guess it's already been moved, so. Madam Chair Burgess. Go ahead, Trustee Burgess. Um, I, I don't recognize friendlies, but I certainly would move that as an amendment and support that as an amendment. So if it's been moved as an amendment to the policy, I support the amendment. Trustee Sipkar, are you moving that? Sure, yeah, I'll move the amendment. Trustee Havel, would you like to second yeah. it? Wonderful, so all in support of that amendment. Thank you very much. And Trustee Burgess, I assume you're in support of that amendment as well. Yes, I am, and on the main motion. Thank you very much. Uh, do we see any other amendments to this policy before I call the question? Seeing none, uh, support for moving the policy as amended. Support, Burgess. Thank you so much. Moving along to policy and regulation assessment, evaluation, and reporting. Looking for a mover for that. Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Hatfield. Any discussion on that? Trustee Halberstadt. Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's uh, Superintendent uh, Howitt that uh, provided this. Yeah, just my question. I went over it, and it's a, it's a bit dense. But um, is there any? Uh, I didn't see any mention of uh, of exams, like final exams, and I know we've discussed that previously here um, what are we what are we doing now and is, is this stable what uh, this particular policy will it need to be changed possibly if we're not providing the, the uh, final exams that some uh, boards are are not doing Sorry. 
Sorry, I'm just looking specifically in the regulation about it. It offers information on both assessment and evaluation. Um, and we address exams, or we would talk about report cards. It doesn't mention anything specifically about exams, but that is part of the evaluation process depending on the teacher. So are you speaking specifically as to right now what we're doing with exams during the COVID uh, pandemic? I would say so, and would it have any impact on the report we're being asked to support tonight? So the, the, the policy and regulation refers to um, both assessment and evaluation, and it is the teacher's judgment whether they use an exam. And at this time, we're also, also offering that opportunity to teachers to use their professional judgment if, if an exam is being used or a, a culminating activity. And we have communicated that to the system in a memo. So it's a hy hybrid model then based on teacher teachers based on teacher assessments i'm sorry i'm confused by your question this, so trustee Abishai, i think what you're talking about is is likely contained in the administrative um procedures of this and it, it those are um those are decisions made by teachers based upon the overarching of this policy but not contained within this policy specifically right but uh, no but i would like to know what we're doing now there will be an opportunity to do that. It's just not germane to this discussion right now. So perhaps at trustee question period, we could do that. Um, anything further on this? I want to leave time for our colleagues on the phone. Oh, uh, support for this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. So I will call the question all in support of this policy wonderful thank you so much moving on to l5 um we have a policy for teaching controversial issues do i have a mover and a seconder trustee cook seconded by trustee sipcar do we have any discussion on this trustee sipcar uh, thank you, Madam Chair. On handwritten 47, uh, I guess I'm moving an amendment then that in the very last sentence um, that it would just read, discussions may impact students, not impact each student. Um, that I think it just provides a bit more clarity as to the general nature as opposed to how it would impact an individual student. So that was uh, feedback that I received from uh, one of my colleagues. So to clarify, that's a moving... Um the final sentence in the administrative procedure that we're looking at on handwritten 47, and be aware of how these topics of discussions may impact students. Seconder for that, Trustee Hatfield, thank you so much. Any discussion on that amendment? I just, Roberta. Go ahead. For clarification only. Go ahead, Trustee Burgess. Thank you. I just wanna make sure I heard it correctly because it, it does cut in and out. Um, so we're striking the word each and putting an S on the end of students? You are correct. Okay, thank you. I support that. Thank you. Looking for a vote on that amendment. Supported. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Any further? On the main motion. Who do I have here on the phone? Uh, Burgess, I support the main motion as well. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So on that, um, if there are no further comments, uh, supporting the all those in support of this uh, policy as amended. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're getting there, guys. Uh, so we're on L6, policy and regulation, employee standards of conduct. Looking for a mover for that. Trustee Sipcar and Trustee Cook. Thank you very much. Any discussion? Trustee Sipcar. Okay, um, on page 51, there is a paragraph at the top that was added. Um, I'm just wondering if I can get a comment from administration as to specifically why that, um, com uh, that paragraph was added as it relates to using a hands-off approach uh, when working with children and coworkers. And so I just wanted to comment as to why, or why that was added. Is that Superintendent Houston? Go right ahead. Thank you for that. Uh, so that was added um, because we do have a hands-off approach. Um, so we needed to clarify to the, in the event of an emergency that, that you may need to touch a student um, to prevent them, for example, from running out into the road. 
Um, so we wanted to add clarity uh, that was missing previously. Trustee Halberstadt. Trustee Hatfield, rather. Okay. <laughs> uh, just so I understand, and then I might uh, propose an amendment. Uh, so does hands-off approach mean, like, that colleagues can't shake hands? Like, like, where does the term, is the term hands-off approach something specific to our HR policies? So hands-off meaning that at no point do we need to touch anybody for any reason. So, you, so colleagues can't shake hands to congratulate each other? You can shake hands, you can but hands-off of, for example, that if a student's sitting in an office that I go by and just pat them on the back, that may not be acceptable to some students, so don't touch them. Could I propose an amendment to this paragraph? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I find that it doesn't flow very well from what number two talks about in terms of personal contact using professional language and, and dressing professionally in your flip-flops and um, jogging pants and T-shirts. Sorry, I'm being facetious, but we don't actually have a dress code. But anyway, um, I don't find that personal conduct in this hands-off approach flow very well in terms of the topic. And to me, anyway, they look like two, like, like this paragraph, the new one, looks like it's kind of stuck there uh, on its own. And I would like to suggest that it actually has a title um, called physical contact and that it read um, to ensure the safety of all and to respect others' personal space. Generally, employees should avoid personal contact when working with children and coworkers unless the child or employee is at risk of harming themselves or others. I think it, I think it explains it better and I think it needs to be separated out from dress code and language. So I'd like to oh, propose wait. that amendment. I just need a seconder for that before we move on. Do I have a seconder for that amendment, Trustee Cheen? And uh, Director Kelly, did you have a comment? That yeah, I just want to comment that the word hands-off approach would be something that people would understand. I think in the, and I think that's why it was probably used, Superintendent Houston. Um, rather than the physical contact. I, I think both could work, but I think it is the language people would understand. Trustee Burgess, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want clarification because I don't want to get sticky here, but I think I heard a, a missing word, and uh, I don't want to get into an amendment. An amendment, perhaps the uh, amender could clarify it for me. So what I think I heard was the, the, the first line sounds sort of similar, to have its own heading, physical contact, but to ensure the safety of all and to respect other pe others' personal space, generally employees should, and I heard, add the words, avoid personal contact. Physical contact, says the, the amender. Okay, because I thought, shouldn't it be physical? So it's avoid physical contact correct yes and then, and then is it an and utilize a hands-off approach or did we strike something so the mover has indicated that uh, rather than striking utilize a hands-off approach we would add into this particular paragraph generally employees should avoid physical contact and utilize a hands-off approach when working uh, with children and coworkers. So I'm, this, I'm, uh, I'm, I support that amendment. Thank, thank you. you. And as the seconder to that, Trustee Cheen, do you support that? Yes. Uh, so I'm looking for a vote on that amendment then. Hands up, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the amended, uh, the amendment is on there under, there we're adding a heading under physical contact. Um, and then uh, adjusting that, that sentence there. Do I see any other amendments to this policy? Seeing and hearing none, I will call the question. Any, uh, who's in support of this uh, policy as amended? 
Thank you very much. Support as urgent. Thank you. Uh, on to L7, Policy and Regulation Interim slash Acting Director of Education. Do I have a mover for that? Sean Mayhew. Okay. <laughs> is now exiting. <laughs> Moved by Sean Mayhew. <laughs> That was, that was well timed, Mr. Mayu. Uh, moved by Trustee Cook, seconded by Trustee Sipkar. Thank you so much. Do we have any discussion on this? Discussion on L7. <laughs> Trustee Sipkar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it was brought to my attention uh, two things on um, number three on uh, handwritten 54. One of them is that. Um, should the or in the sentence where it says or the executive assistant um, to the director of education should really be an and um, and I, I think that that might be the case or was that not is that not how it was supposed to read I think this, is correct. this is correct okay um, there were two things that were brought forward as as amendments. One was changing that to an and, and then the second one was also adding uh, the superintendent of human resources to the list. Um, and the reason for that that change, that's be, uh, the second change being suggested, is because um, it makes the it balances out the numbers in terms of like making them uneven, and then also it adds another perspective onto that advisory committee without it being too large. Um, I'd be curious for administration's uh, opinion on that. It was just brought to me uh, today, um, so we didn't have the chance to discuss it at the policy committee level, um, but it is something that was brought forward as a potential amendment. Um, Madam Chair, clarification? I'll let Director Kelly speak, and then, and then for clarification, we can go to you, Trustee Burgess. I think this revision to the policy came Just about... Give me the question that we're listening to. Pardon me, Trustee Burgess. Did you just point what section, what number in, I'm trying to follow along. I don't know where in the policy. It was uh, we're at, um, so under regulation, interim acting director of education, we're at uh, number three. Number three. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, Director Kelly. No problem. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I just think that the reason that that was in, remember this, the appointment of the director would be the decision of the Board of Trustees, right? And so I, I'm not sure you would have more staff on it would be one thing I would point out. The reason for the change is the qualifications for director of education no longer have to be a teacher. So um, I think that that reason that that was put in, but I, I see what you're saying, um, but I do think it is a decision of the trustees. So I'm not sure why you would add extra staff, but it's an advisory committee. It's just really talking about process, I would, I would argue. Do we have, yes, do we have discussion on this? Trustee Hatfield, thank you. I'm confused. I thought this was an advisory committee in the event that the director is not able to fulfill their role. This, has, this isn't with regard to hiring of a director. Correct. Okay, then I'm, not, I'm confused by your remarks even more. Do you, do you have a question through to the, the oh, okay. director? Okay, so, all right. So, uh, the way I read this, so you're either going to take the superintendent of business or the executive assistant. That, to me, doesn't make sense. Uh, you're going to pick either the SO business or the executive director, the way this reads which is why I think, as Trustee Sipkar said, the word and is more appropriate if you want the executive assistant to the director there. And the reason why I, I agree that the superintendent of HR should be included is because when you're looking at a sudden inability of the director of education uh, to perform uh, the, the duties, that there's going to be HR implications to what's going on so uh, it makes sense to me that the chair and vice chair are consulting with the superintendent of business and HR um, but to replace the superintendent with the executive assistant I found confusing so the and makes more sense to me 
and the need to consult with uh, HR makes a lot of sense to me. Through you, Madam Chair, I'm just wondering what you would do if those individuals wanted to do that role. It, Great. Just to, as a clarification from when we talked about it at policy committee, this was because those uh, the regulation has changed now where di uh, directors don't have to be um, teachers. And so a superintendent of business wouldn't necessarily have been able before. Um, most of them are, are, are accountants, like our, our fine superintendent business now. Um, and so would, would they to be or to apply to be the interim director the superintendent of business obviously could not sit on their own leadership advisory committee. And so we would replace that in that particular case, we would replace that with the executive assistant to the director of education. So it wouldn't be an and in that case that that's, I don't think that would be uh, an appropriate place for and, um, but if the superintendent of business were to apply to be the interim director, um, the executive assistant to the director would be on that advisory committee. I don't think this speaks to that at all. That scenario. So do you have, are you? Madam Chair Burgess. Do we have a suggestion for this? P Trustee Burgess, do you have uh, a suggestion to add? It's a question that I'm asking. I, I, um, I'm I looking at this uh, paragraph like I, for the first time, even though it passed in front of us, I believe at policy, did it not? It did. Um, yeah, so I think the sentences are kind of reversed because it sounds, it, by the, I'm judging by the questions being asked. I think there's confusion between applicants and what the role of the leadership advisory committee is in the interim, in the selection of the interim acting director of education. So I think questions and why I agree the or instead of the and is because there might be possible applicants that are present uh, employees and one of whom, since the new regulation provincially says you don't have to be a Ontario College of Teacher, you know, uh, you just have to be a supervisory officer, but S superintendent of business may be an applicant. So the or makes sense to me because it's one or the other. But I think that the, the last sentence, the role of this leadership advisory committee is to direct the succession process and according with this regulation, that sort of, in a way, perhaps should be the preface to that. So I think trustees, rather than us maybe getting through this tonight, I think maybe it should go back to policy committee. So um, motion to refer back to policy. Indeed, yep. Can we refer? You you would second that. So the motion on the floor is to refer this back to policy committee for further consultation. Uh, seconded by Trustee Hatfield. All in support of that. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, for the ability to move that along. And so uh, what I would say that for anybody who uh, who has some some insight into this, um, please forward those comments on to policy committee um, and the, the contents of, of that um, or the leader or the membership of that is in a report that's contained within here. So we'll move forward. That one is going back to our policy committee. We are at L8, which is strategic plan and board plans. Uh, do I have a mover for this policy? Trustee Sipkar, seconded by Trustee. Thank you. Seconded by Trustee Burgess. Um, do we have any discussion? Uh, Trustee Sipkar. Uh, just really quickly on handwritten 58 and 59. Um, if you go to C1, where it says SMART goals, uh, I think SMART should be smelled, or spelled out um, as opposed to an acronym, and then it's found again on 59 in uh, D3. I know it's a commonly used acronym, but uh, I believe it's best practice to stay away from those in our policies. Um, so it's just uh, a, a, a grammatical thing there. Do we have a seconder for that, Trustee Hatfield? Any discussion on that amendment? Spelling out work. Just for clarification, what does SMART mean? <laughs> Superintendent Howitt. 
specific, strategic. measurable, attainable, um, realistic, and time and time bound. Sorry, it took me a minute. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so that'll be right up. Trustee Halverset's alley with the uh, eliminating as many acronyms as we possibly can. I like that. Uh, all in support of that of that amendment. Thank you very much. Do we have further discussion on on this policy? Sure. I just think that long ago we talked about not using acronyms in policies and regulations, especially that they're posted on our website for um, you know the community to access. So. I, I think that's just being consistent with that. I absolutely appreciate that. And as a member of the policy committee, I will uh, take that under advisement as well. Thank you very much. So we have an amended motion and I'm calling uh, for the question on the amended motion. All in support. The motion is amended. And that passes. Wonderful. So now we're on to L9. Policy and regulation naming and renaming of board facilities. Uh, mover and a seconder for that. Moved by Trustee Sipcar, seconded by Trustee Cook. Do we have any comments uh, or questions? Trustee Sipcar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, this one actually we have debated over the course of six or, or six meetings, five meetings. Um, so it took us a while to get here, but um, I'm I'm really pleased with I think the where the naming policy is at. The only suggestion, or the only amendment I'm going to move, actually, sorry, there's two, um, and uh, that I'm gonna move is um, the, on, on the bottom of handwritten 63, there is a paragraph that says, this information will be provided to the naming renaming committee prior to their first meeting in the form of a written report with suggestions itemized by top choices, themes, etc." I actually think that that paragraph should be on handwritten 64 under number three where it was originally intended. And I, I can't remember at the policy committee why we moved it, but I don't, I don't know what from this first page here that would be contained in that paragraph that we would then do that. So I think it, it makes sense. Um, if anybody from the policy committee wants to speak to it or remembers otherwise, but I think that that sentence um, needs to be moved. No, I don't want to get into a ton of, there's a few edits here, but I, that was one that was an important one. Uh, seconded uh, by Trustee Hatfield. Do we have discussion on, on that amendment? Burgess? Go ahead, Trustee Burgess. My understanding, if I can remember, was because I thought it fell under two, a media release and communication to school applicants of the committee, blah, 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 rather than three, which is community input being sought. Can I ask a question there, a point of um, clarification? Trustee Burgess, can you specifically say that where it should be going again, where you think it should be going again? Well, I think it was moved. Just removed it altogether. Moved, it was moved from three and placed under two. Sorry, the suggestion is then to move it back to where uh, it was for, from Trustee Burgess, I believe. No, no, I, 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 what I heard was um, from Trustee Sipcar that she can't remember, we can't remember why it was moved. And I, I think we moved it because we thought it fit better under two. I'm not arguing one way or the other. I appreciate that, Trustee Burgess. I think it should be moved back to the bottom of uh, number three. I think if you read it logically, it flows better there, and I just don't know why we changed it, so. Okay, so um, I'm good as long as it's included. Thank you very much. So that amendment has a mover and a seconder. If there's no more discussion on that, um, I will be looking for a vote um, on that amendment, um, which is to move uh, the sentence at the end of the last sentence on handwritten 33 or 63 back to um, underneath um, the paragraph at number three. So all those in favor? Right. That amendment passes. Any more discussion? Trustee Sipcar, did you have another amendment? Yes. <laughs> um, 
In number five, um, the last sentence, uh, it says this feedback as well as I uh, want to amend to take the out of that sentence. Um, so it's as well as staff and student focus group feedback will be presented. Um, it, it reads therefore that you, there has to be staff and student focus group, but really number three doesn't give an, uh, an absolute mandate to do that. So by removing the the, it just says if there was staff and student focus group feedback. Um, so I'll, I would move that amendment. That's been seconded by Trustee Hatfield. Hey. Burgess, I, I just get where it was again, sorry. Sorry, we're at uh, in number five on handwritten 64. Um, it would be the last sentence in that paragraph. This feedback, as well as staff and student focus group feedback, will be presented to the committee for consideration at the second meeting. That's the amendment that we are. And where is that going? Or Nope, it's just staying or? in the, yep, staying in the same spot. We're just removing a word. So right now it reads as well as the staff and student focus groups. We're just removing the word the. Yep. So all in support of that amendment. Yep. Tremendous. Any other amend? Or yes, we just voted on that. Any other amendments to this? Trustee Sipcock. Okay, one more here. Um, so for Trustee Burgess, we're in section seven. <laughs> the last point, it says diverse representation. Um, and it was brought to my attention by a colleague that perhaps it should be representation or representations of diversity. Um, so reversing the two words. Uh, I'm not married to either. I don't think, I, or the, the original I should say, and, and the, the other one I think actually does make a little bit more sense, but I'm open to um, feedback on that amendment. But I'll make it. So that amendment is put on the floor by Trustee Sipkar, seconded by Trustee Hatfield. Any discussion on that amendment? So that would be for everybody following along under number seven on handwritten 64. The last bullet point currently says diverse representation. What the amendment is proposing to change it to is representations of diversity. Representations or representation of. Mayor Dinesh. Representations of diversity, representation. Okay. I originally, I said it with an S, uh, but it could just be representation of, di of diversity. And so I'm looking for feedback from my colleagues on that. A uh, comment by Trustee Hatfield. Uh, I just think that the, the proposed wording uh, represents a uh, proper, um, articulation of a criteria as opposed to diverse representation. So I think it's an appropriate amendment. Thank you for that. Any more discussion on that? So I will take a vote on that amendment to change diverse representation to representations of diversity. All in support. Support Burgess. Wonderful. Any other amendments to this particular policy? Trustee Chin? Uh, item, item five uh, on page 64, uh, the committee chair, I think it should be capital letter, right? Through the committee chair. Item five. Do I have a seconder for that? Trustee Sipkar. It may just be a typo, but I think we're being Thorough. <laughs> so, uh, all in support of that amendment. Wonderful. Any other amendments to this policy? Trustee Hatfield. I, I just need a clarification on the appendices to this. So, there's appendix A, B, and I think a C. But I think some of these are all new. I don't think we had these all before. So I, I just wanted to be clear because they're all in black ink and so changes are usually in a different color. So before I speak, I just wanted to know exactly which of these appendices are, are revisions and then I can speak to it. Director Kelly. I think that uh, the uh, first appendice, well, I guess the, that's the application, the, uh, 
is not new. I think Appendix B is definitely new. That's a complete new um, request that was. Uh, supplemental, yeah. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So just, uh, I just wanted to know that, uh, so we would be approving these new appendices, which would become part of the regulations, if I'm following this correctly. So I just wanted to be clear that what it's saying is from this day forward, the term academy can only be attached to a K-12 school because we do have, we had a recent renaming where the word academy was attached to a secondary school, not a K-12. to So I, I just wanted to be clear that this is new and that it, what it's saying is moving forward, the word is only appropriate for a K-12 to school. My understanding was to bring clarity to that. I think I looked at Ms. LaBeouf, is that what, the, yeah, as I recall. Okay, thank you, because I've been working on this one for a long time. I've been asking for it, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So no amendments there. <laughs> so we have um, an amended motion on the floor uh, for naming and renaming of board facilities. Uh, I'm going to give our um, colleagues on the phone a second to unmute Port themselves. Wonderful. Board. Thank you so much. So looking board. for support on this uh, amended motion on naming and renaming of board facilities. Board. All in support. Wonderful. And thank you very much to everybody who participated in that. That was quite a lengthy discussion at Policy Committee um, for good reason. Um, and we heard a lot from the community on this and I really appreciate that. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody and, and, and thank everybody for passing that through. Okay, so we are now at report of the Director of Education. Oh, oh. 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 is now oh. exiting. Okay, so we still have L10. I tried to skip too far, I'm sorry. So, one more policy uh, and regulation over time non bargaining union employees moved by Trustee Hatfield, seconded by Trustee Cook. Any discussion on this policy? that I tried to entirely skip over. Seeing and hearing none, I will call the question on support of this policy as presented. Thank you so much. Now we are at M1, report of the Director of Education. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is a time of year for hope and faith and joy. In the midst of a pandemic, it might be difficult to find those things in 2020, but if you look, they're still there. At Leamington District High School, they have themselves a new holiday bell. It's actually an old one, moved over from the former Mill Street Public School, and it will be rung for special occasions at the high school. The town of Kingsville recently held its drive-by parade, and the end was a display of skill from the Kingsville District High School tech zone. The students built the sleigh for Santa and Miss Claus. At William McWilliam Public School, students recently started an ambitious mural, mural project in the main hallway, and they finished it up this week, a beautiful winter scene in the mountains to brighten things up for the season. For those kids from Glenwood Public School, words are worth a thousand pictures. They have recently completed another stage of Lexia reading program, which is helping so many of our students with their reading skills. And the annual Student Senate Leadership Conference went online this year, run by our wonderful student trustees, and it attracted the leader of the federal MDP party, Jasmeet Singh, and who spoke to students about being a person of color in politics. But I want to give a big shout out to these ladies who organized this. It was great. There were some tense moments at the beginning, and they fixed it all, and it was wonderful. So I was proud to be part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, there's tremendous leadership being shown throughout the board by students and staff who are helping others in their communities. And at Gore Hill, they collected 1,969 food items for the Leamington Salvation Army. And at Gosfield North, they're supporting some local families with a giving tree. 
The Riverside Secondary School leadership students have been collecting food in the community for local food banks, and at DM Eagle, 228 pairs of pajamas were donated for a special project called Lolo's Pajama Project. And the Greater Essex County Virtual School Googled up some Christmas spirit, collecting more than $600 to support three local families through the Children's Aid Society. And at LaSalle Public School, students and staff collected 1,383 personal hygiene items for the Windsor Essex Food Banks. And A.V. Graham had a great response to their Breakfast Buddies program and the annual cereal box challenge brought in three big van loads of cereal for school food and snack programs. Grade 8 students in the Bell River family of schools got an early gift from their high school. These noble um, experience boxes were sent to every grade 8 in their family and they'll be able to have an online tour of the school and get more information on programs actually that's happening tonight I believe and Riverside is holding their online event tomorrow and Massey and General Amherst will have theirs on Thursday. Students in Mr. Voy's grade 7 class at A.V. Graham wrote Christmas cards to members of the Canadian Armed Forces serving overseas during the holiday season. And this is my holiday card with artwork from grade 3 students at David Maxwell Public School. The kids drew themselves catching some snowflakes on their tongues. And you can actually see the originals posted on the bulletin board in the second floor hallway for you to enjoy. And those are some of the wonderful things happening around the board. Thank you, Director Kelly. So wonderful anymore to get to hear good news, and I'm so grateful that we have so much of that across the system. Thank you very much. So moving on to the OPSPA Director and Delegate Report, and this time it's from me. So um, I was uh, able to attend the Board of Directors meeting, uh, the last Board of Directors meeting that we had in November. Um, and I do, I do apologize that I don't have a written report <laughs> yet. I will get one uh, out to you, but uh, I did want to provide some highlights from, uh, from that board of directors. So some of the GSN funding, which we've seen tonight um, with heavy advocacy from OBSPA um, and the support of member boards and other stakeholders to ensure this funding was extended to boards for our realized needs. Um, though with respect, uh, much of the funds that we still needed had to take from our reserves and I think other boards are experiencing that as well. Um, there were, was talk of the, um, that high um, priority funds uh, uh, for the boards that were moved into red. Um, I did ask the question of whether that set a precedent um, uh, for boards like ours who uh, at the time of that meeting we were moving into the red on the following Monday. Um, there wasn't an answer to that yet, but uh, finance was taking that back, um, so I'm hopeful that we'll, we'll hear something about that. Um, and, and perhaps if, if trustees would like to advocate uh, with a letter to the minister um, regarding this funding for boards to be extended to us by the precedent set um, by the previous 13 six point million that went to uh, 12 other boards, we can entertain the idea of, of sending a letter for that. Um, I won't do that now, but um, there's a possibility for that. Um, Equity, diversity, and inclusion at OPSPA. Um, this was a very um, uh, well um, put together motion by uh, one of our uh, member boards from the north um, to, uh, to put this um, following motion, which passed unanimously at the board of directors meeting. Um, it is a bit lengthy, but I think it is uh, important for us to read it out. Um, so this passed unanimously, um, be it resolved that the Ontario Public School Boards Association hire an external third party to conduct an equity, diversity and inclusion audit to determine the best approach to combating systemic racism and oppressive practices introspectively within our own organization with an expected outcome of determining best practices, strategies and approaches to advocate and support an inclusive OPSPA organization and to support school boards with regards to anti-black and anti-indigenous racism and that the external third party report back to OPS board directors regularly about the progress of the audit and provide a final report with recommendations and with our own uh, policy committee considering some of these things I thought that was um, a very timely thing indeed as that will inform some of our practices as well as we move forward through those policies. Um, 
on that, uh, you will have seen, and I believe it was just uh, resent out today by Rusty uh, Hicks, there is a professional learning opportunity for trustees and student trustees um, coming up in 2021, an intensive human rights program for school board leaders. Um, it's two half day sessions. They're coming up very quickly. There's one in December and then another one in uh, January for the first session. And then there's uh, a follow up session as well. Um, there's details in your email for that. Uh, along the lines of professional development as well, December 10th, uh, I'm going to um, uh, draw our attention to a speaker and professional development series. Um, we have a speaker from OISE, who is also a teacher with the TDSB and is a regular contributor to the Toronto Star. Um, he is giving a, a talk on December 10th, and that's available to all trustees as well. Um, and so I do apologize for not having a written report for you all, but those are some of the kind of highlights of, of that. Um, and that's all I have for uh, Office of Director Delegate. Trustee Burgess, do you have anything to add? No, I had exactly that, the human rights uh, professional development and the opportunity on Thursday, December 10th from noon till 1 of the speaker from OISE. So thank you for covering all that. Certainly. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to Trustee Sipkar and to Trustee Burgess for all their work on OSPA, um on our behalf last year. Um, so now we're moving on to M3 report of the striking committee. Um, I have... So Vice Chair C Cook and I met with Director Kelly and Madam LaBeouf to complete the report you see before you, and I thank them for their efforts, and thank you especially to Madam LaBeouf for making it so organized for this rookie to follow. Um, and you'll note, uh, trustees on handwritten 80, that there are openings as alternates for the city and county and school board liaisons. No one did indicate a preference for these, um, and so if you would like that to be you, <laughs> you can email me or, uh, or Vice Chair Cook. And uh, congratulations again to all, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to the work. Do you have any comments on this? Seeing and hearing none. I'm tired of me yet. Uh, moving on to the chair's report. Um, I'll be brief, as we've heard me speak enough today. Um, I want to thank my fellow trustees for their support this week. And I hope that even through the ups and downs of a meeting with many contentious issues, you can see that I respect each of your voices and value the fairness inherent in progress and process. Um, may not make me popular, but it keeps me honest. Uh, this is our final meeting before our holiday break, and we have students returning to Bagley this week. Uh, I'm grateful for both in their own way, and I thank our staff and admin for their truly exhaustive efforts in getting us this far and in carrying through to the end of this challenging calendar year. Uh, and I want to talk to our students for just a hot second. Um, we can't actually know what this has been like for you, this constant state of anxious change. We see it from our perspective, but it's truly been a minute since we were kids. Uh, I want to thank you all for all you've done to show up for yourselves. We're very proud of you. Take care of yourselves and each other, your teachers, principals, vice principals, staff at your schools. Take care of those you call family around the holiday season and the break. And happy whatever cause you choose to celebrate to each of you here and to each of you out there. And with that, we are at trustee question period. Any questions from trustees? Trustee Hatfield. Uh, I have two, so can you put me on the list? Um, so my first question is um, with regard to the strong recommendation from the uh, public health unit, um, as well as I guess from our board, that students uh, from K to grade three should uh, wear a mask if they're comfortable with it. Um, I think that's the message that we heard several times from Dr. Ahmed, that it's strongly recommended. And I'm just wondering from administration, um, do we put that message out to parents? Thank you. Yes, we do put that out. It's on our website. It's on our mask protocol. And we're constantly reminding um, our families about the mask protocol and what that looks like for students right from JK right to grade 8. Uh, sorry, to grade 12. 
Any other first questions from trustees? Student trustee Younger. Um, it's been brought to my attention and I've been thinking about it a lot recently. There's a problem that many secondary students are expected to print off their course materials themselves, um, which assumes problematically that students have printers, number one, and that they're able to financially support the continuous and often excessive use of ink and paper, printer ink and printer paper. So unfortunately this favors and advantages students of middle or higher class and excludes those students who may not have printers or cannot financially support this habit. And it creates obstacles for those doing virtual learning um, because it's very difficult to keep up with um, academic work if you have to manually write when the teachers expect you to print off um, the notes. And often your notes are not of adequate quality because, for example, diagrams can't be included. And if your printer malfunctions at any point, you're um, forced to switch to manual writing on the fly, and it's, it's a stressful experience for sure, especially for students who are um, heavily involved in academics. For example, an international baccalaureate program, there's standards that have to be reached, and it's often a stressful experience if students um, can't make that happen. So um, printing on such a consistent basis is financially draining, um, often 10 plus pages per day. Um, expensive materials, ink and paper are. And there are now students who have to pay to print their notes at Staples, for example, which costs a minimum of $5. And this is absolutely not acceptable. Um, so I realize the solution to this might be complex and require a lot of thought, but I'd like to um, at least maybe students could print in their school libraries with, pr with proper protocol, and at least educators could be made aware of this issue and encourage an innovative approach. Um, so I, cause my question is just, um, are we thinking about this? Is something that's on our mind? And if so, how are we planning to mitigate this issue? Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, um, I look to the superintendents from the secondary panel, uh, but I do think that um, this is something we are supplying devices. I'm not sure that printers are, are within our budget, uh, but there may be some things we could suggest to schools to alleviate the problem. I don't know if uh, Superintendent Canty or Superintendent Pike want to speak to that. Actually, it hadn't been raised before, so thank you for raising it, uh, Trustee Younger. Through you, Madam Chair, thank you for the uh, question. Um, I, I was unaware that this was an issue, and I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the principals have been asked about this. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Berard at your school uh, would, would be glad to help out with this situation. Uh, we certainly don't want to create uh, a greater gap or disparity in, in what students are able to do. So um, speak to your principal, and I would, I would certainly encourage other students to speak to their, their administration at their school so they can be taken care of. Thank you very much. Any other? Trustee Halberstadt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, at the last meeting, uh, we had some, I think we heard from, uh, I think it was Mario Spagnolo, who we heard from earlier, but one of the things he was talking about was making life a little easier for teach actual, actual virtual teachers uh, by allowing them to work at home, and I'm wondering if administration is working on that or... I, I believe that has been communicated to people and if they wanted to do that and um, made application to do so that that was uh, approved. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> student Trustee Suave. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my question is regarding grade eight and grade 12 graduations. As we know, they're very important to our students and our families and I've received several questions from students regarding them. And I know we're under, you know, very special circumstances in that our, the pandemic is always changing and we're, we can't predict what's gonna happen in June. But are we looking into or suggesting to schools outdoor venues? Are we thinking about how we can make sure that if it is virtual, we can do it to the highest uh, quality for our students to create that sense of school community as they move into their secondary school or post-secondary education? Again, a good question. We, I don't know how much thinking has been put to that for um, both grade 8 or grade 12 graduation, but I think you've raised something that we need to consider. We do want to ensure that there is good quality to that, and uh, we don't know where we'll be, so we probably should plan with some of that in mind. I know last year, uh, Superintendent Allwender uh, did some work on that with a group, and again, I think, we should, uh, I think you've given us a good idea to start the planning on that, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Do I have any other questions from trustees before I go to uh, Trustee Hatfield's second question? Go ahead, Trustee Hatfield. Uh, thank you. My second question is a procedural thing. And um, you mentioned it along the course of the meeting tonight that we open our public meeting at 6 p.m., but we don't stream at 6 p.m. 
uh, I'm not looking to uh, make Carl work uh, longer hours, but I think there is a, a shortcoming uh, with the fact that we don't live stream that, and that is that when we come back at 7 p.m., uh, we don't repeat the attendance. Attendance is announced at 6 p.m., so at 7 p.m., the public uh, doesn't know that we have two trustees joining us on the phone uh, until you speak to them on the phone during the course of the meeting. They don't know if someone has called in regrets. Um, so, you know, either we should be live streaming at 6 p.m. and cutting off when we convene into private session to avoid the problem of, um, because there have been changes to the agenda, not, not just tonight, but several times that the public wouldn't be aware of. Um, and, and again, I think the attendance is a big thing that uh, our public should, should know. Because um, I think the public assumes that at 7 p.m. we are starting our public meeting. So I don't know what we could do differently, but I'm asking, is there something we could do differently um, to take those factors into consideration? So I will, I will pose this question to Director Kelly. What I will say about our board meetings is that they are currently in our bylaws, uh, the way that the agenda is. Um, that doesn't speak to, uh, to uh, live streaming and then, and then cutting off for our, um, for our private session, which, which we used to do in the boardroom right. behind us, um, and we are now unable to do because of, uh, of restrictions for, for a number of people in there. Um, so so our, our agendas are, are prescribed by our bylaws, the order of the agendas. Um, however, uh, uh, I think the, um, the live streaming perhaps you could speak to. Well, certainly we, we have live streaming and we have somebody doing it for 30 seconds, which is what usually that takes would be a bit of a challenge and then waiting for an hour or two would be, be challenging. We can think about that. I don't know if um, Slabov has any ideas on that either, but... Uh, uh, we, we could look to that. I, I see the point, and if anyone has a suggestion for that, I, I'm not sure that paying uh, for the streaming of that two minutes would be um, fiscally, you know, the best way. Or is there a way to repeat some of that when we come back into the 7 o'clock session, which might be another way to, to do that? I can appreciate that. Thank you for that question. So, um I mean that, yeah. It'll be a part of our, our minutes for uh, for our next meeting. So perhaps something to to bring back up at, at next meeting, um, in, as part of business arising from the minutes. If there's been any movement on it, and certainly by by email, if you want to send me an email, and um, and we can come up with some ideas. That's maybe a way. Thank you. I appreciate that question. Any other questions from trustees? Let me run on the phone. I do have one. Um, so uh, we, we learned today that General Brock has an outbreak as of today, uh, though it is different from what happened at Bagley. Um, and so I'm wondering if we can get an update from admin on the supports available to families and how what we learned from Bagley has applied here and how those, are, those two situations are different. So you're correct that these two situations are different. Um, they did call, they did call, the Medical Officer of Health did call an outbreak at Bagley which then resulted in a school closure at the same time. In this particular case for General uh, Brock, it was just a, um, an outbreak, just restricted to one particular cohort of students. So we have followed the same protocols that we're following typically when we let go, uh, dismiss a cohort and the staff um, in terms of how that's done. In this particular case, the cohort was already at home. They were already self-isolating. And so now they're just tracking the number of students who um, are coming with COVID. And in, in, by definition for an outbreak, there was two that they have deemed to be connected. So that's the difference between the two. Um, in terms of them coming back, again, we, we really rely on our health unit to assist us in terms of when it's uh, safe to bring the students back in terms of their self-isolation period. What we've learned is um, we have to prepare. All of us in the board have to prepare that there could be an outbreak at any of our schools. 
So encouraging staff and students to take home their personal items and of course their items to do if you're a teacher or a support staff in order to conduct your class online. That was one of our biggest learnings. The other uh, learning is to do um, with preparing ourselves mentally for this, for the shift. Um, it's very alarming to us and very stressful when we know it's out there in the community, but then when it comes to our own schools, it's a little bit different. And people are reacting um, in different ways. All of us are in terms of when it comes to the school. So that's another big learning that we had. Our process was solid. We, of course, fine-tuned it because as we learn, we're always adding to our processes and making things smoother, making sure we're prepared prior to um, the medical officer of health calling an outbreak. But we're really confident in what we've got written and as we evolve it, um, so it's a pretty solid process. But overall, our hearts, of course, go out to everyone, um, any cohort that's been dismissed and to the staff associated with that, but especially right now to our current outbreak um, at General Brock. Thank you. And just to clarify one point, um, uh, there was a, a um, mention in the from our first outbreak about um, supports for families as far as um, translation services and, and, and things that they may find um, stressful in, in information gathering. So I'm wondering, and, and as trustee or as uh, Superintendent Mills pointed out earlier, um, technology that may be provided to them. So I'm wondering what supports are available to families in these sorts of cases. Translation has been um, completed by the health unit in terms of all of our communication. If we are going to be sending something, which we haven't this, for this particular outbreak, that it would be done by school messenger, it certainly would be translated as well. They have pivoted, um, or they will be pivoting to online learning, and so making sure the students who need um, the technology will be getting it, and certainly working very closely with the ITS services to ensure that that's uh, properly done. There's always services too for mental health. We've got, our staff has got um, quite a compendium of um, different resources that they can be using within their classroom and certainly allowing our staff the same kinds of resource um, allocations through our Jeep program or for our life, not life touch, life works program for some of our um, other staff. So we've got those types of supports too. But I think it also behooves us, of all of us, to put our support out to the families and to um, our students and to our staff and administrators who are managing that at this point too. Thank you very much. And to that point, um, I was, uh, it warmed my heart to see uh, when uh, in our uh, Bagley outbreak, teachers from the virtual school reaching out to, uh, to educators who were kind of new and thrust into this at a very stressful time and offering their support. So I want to thank um, that professional um, courtesy to each other and that kind of family feeling. I, uh, it's, I know it's always been there, um, but as always, we're kind of shining light on things and, and that was a, an excellent thing. So, so thank you for that. So we are at, oh, a trustee, are you have a, a question, trustee team? Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question is uh, still with the mandatory mask from K to uh, three, grade three. And uh, uh, it's a pity that we didn't have uh, give, uh, you know, give chance for the, uh, to listen to the delegates and uh, listen to the discussions before we make decision that uh, we even didn't, didn't give chance for discussion. But uh, I, it's, it's nothing like what you said, it's nothing regarding uh, disrespect for or uh, it's not my personal interest and I don't want to put the trustees to, to, to be frustrated. I just want to be responsible and to protect the Trustee, system. Is there a question? Yeah, my question is that, uh, is there a way to put it on the floor to discuss? Because I think it's important, and uh, especially after we listen to the delegates. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Chin. Um, so as, as far as procedure goes, as we, as we spoke about um, at the opening of the, of the meeting and the approval of the agenda, there is um, the opportunity for um, a motion for reconsideration, which was put on the floor um, and was voted on um, by trustees. Uh, that was accomplished. Um, it is always uh, in order for that to come forward again um, by a member of the prevailing side. Uh, however, there has been um, 
there's been consensus on it multiple times now. Um, and it is uh, the will of trustees that we are respecting. Um, and so, no, it is not disrespectful to, uh, to uh, bring it up and to, to talk about it, but it is um, respectful for us to, by virtue of the, the rules that we govern ourselves under and by virtue of this respect that we show to each other, uh, that we do things by, uh, um, by the procedure, which was contentious today, absolutely, but we did it um, by, by speaking as a board of trustees. So I can appreciate that and I can appreciate um, the frustration of it. Um, it was the will of the Board of Trustees um, on several occasions that we discussed earlier tonight um, and we made a decision as a Board of Trustees. Um, and so moving forward we will continue to, uh, to use our procedures and our bylaws in that way um, and, and enter into discussion in, in that kind of way. Uh, can, I, can I make a comment? So uh, in this pandemic, we don't have any contingent, contingency plan or any you know, special procedure for handling those motions. I think uh, that's not as usual. Those motions, they are important and crucial. If that's something that you'd like to entertain a potential notice of motion on to put to the floor for your trustees, uh, your fellow colleagues, that, that may be something that you, that you want to do, but it's not in order uh, here to do that during trustee question period. So, do we have any other questions from trustees? So we are now at notices of motion. Trustee Halberstadt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I have a notice of motion for January 19th board meeting that administration provide a report on non-clot cleaning products approved in our schools and the cost. Also to be included in the report, the identity, the identity of other Ontario school boards that do not, not use clots and identify the cleaning products they do use and if possible the reasons why they switched. Uh, that report would be to be presented at the, at the February 2nd board meeting. And again, the notice of motion would be on January of the 19th to be considered. Thank you very much. Any other notices of motion from trustees? Motion Burgess. Trustee Burgess. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a notice of motion. It is a recommendation and I will um, forward it to Madam LaBeouf. The recommendation that the GECDSB determined by board discussion and or referral to a committee for their recommendation, what is meant by the word, quote, session, quote, as per Robert's Rules newly revived, re revised and, and uh, in brackets 12th chapter 4, uh, 12th edition chapter 4, 8 colon 4, and any other pertinent sections as well as determine if special rules need adoption regarding renewal of motion. Thank you for that, Trustee Burgess. And both Trustee Halberstadt and Trustee Burgess, will you please send the, the wording of those motion, notices of motion to Madame LaBeouf. Thank you. Point of clarification. Point of clarification. The notice of motion was to come back February 2nd, but that's not a regular board meeting date. Sorry, I believe he said February 17th. I thought he said February 2nd, sorry. I think I did say 2nd, it's the 17th, right? So that's just for clarification. It's gonna be the next public, or the February 17th okay, board meeting. Right. Is that right? February yes. 16th. Thank you. February 16th. 16th or 17th, I don't have my calendar in front of me. Madame LaBeouf, what is the? Sixteenth. Sixteenth. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Any other notices of motion from trustees? Any announcements? Do we have any announcements from trustees? What's that? Oh, the trustee Alberstadt. Can you turn on your mic? The letters to the minister. Right. Yes, we do have. Uh, sorry, we're not quite there yet. We're uh, just looking for announcements from from trustees. Okay. 
Uh, seeing none, though, uh, I, we have two uh, letters attached to our minutes here. One to uh, Minister Lecce, which we, uh, as trustees by consensus, I believe, came to um, wanted to send about uh, the 34 credits. So that's been sent, and another one around uh, COVID-19 funding. Those have been sent on our behalf, and thank you very much for that. Uh, so we are now at adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by. No? Move. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. Julia Burgess is now exiting.